Good afternoon and welcome to our Carbon Farming Workshop. My name is Hannah Layla and I am the CEO of the WA Future Food Network and host of today's workshop. I would first like to acknowledge that we are hosting and recording this workshop from Noongar Budja. We recognise the strengths, resilience and capacity of the Noongar people and their continuing connection to the land, waters and community. We pay respect to them, their cultures and to elders both past and present. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which you are all streaming in from and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in this workshop today. The Future Food Network came together last year after our Future of Food conference, where we saw a need to connect the different sectors and industries that make up the food and beverage supply chain. We have a network of members who can access latest industry updates, invitations to industry events, and access to the Connectory, which is an online portal for producers and other businesses to connect with value adders, packaging suppliers, transport companies, retailers, and everyone in between all in one place. You can sign up to our network and the Connect Room for free at www.futurefoodnetwork.com.au. We also have the Future Food Producer Group, which allows us to focus on farming initiatives such as the Greening Farms Project through Peel Harvey Catchment Council and the Soil Carbon Project that we are supporting with Meat and Livestock Australia and Pedega Investments. Our aim is to continue building a progressive, connected and sustainable agri-food industry across the whole supply chain. This workshop could not have gone ahead without the support from the Peel Harvey Catchment Council through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program. We thank them for their support and I would like to introduce Mick Davey, Davis, sorry, uh, to speak briefly on the Greening, Greening Farms project that this workshop is funded through. Thanks, Mick. Thanks very much, Hannah. Uh, the Peel Harvey Cashman Council is very excited to be working with the Future Farm Network to support this virtual workshop. Uh, through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program, we're also proud to be working with our local community to create diverse and productive agricultural landscapes while supporting healthy and resilient communities. And it's only by doing this together that we can make a big difference. The Phil Harvey's Greening Farms Project is all about encouraging an increase in vegetation cover across our farming landscape. So whether it's more about fodder for meat producers, uh, interest, increasing habitat links, or seeing increase in, uh, increases in scales of planting for carbon sequestration, we know that greening farms are much more productive farms. Increasing on-farm vegetation can increase impacts from wind and water erosion, provide shelter for stock, increase green feed during the summer autumn feed gap, and do things like reduce soil temperature, which protects our soil microbes and supports an increased soil health. And that's good for everybody. We hope that through the Greening Farms program, Landholders across the catchment can learn which opportunities suit them the most and get started on greening their farms in their way. By supporting this event, we want to provide everyone the chance to increase their understanding of what opportunities carbon farming can offer, to improve their awareness of the smart use of different fertilisers, and start to, to look at how good data management can increase on-farm productivity. And there's some good gains to be made in that area. I'm really looking forward to hearing from everybody today and I'm sure everyone across Australia and uh, internationally are too. So um, I'll give them everybody back to you. Thanks Mick. We would also like to thank our other supporters of this workshop, Meat and Livestock Australia, Pedaga Investments and the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. Plus all of our speakers for sharing their time and expertise with us. Before I run through the program, I'd like to summarise some of the responses to the questions you answered in the pre-event survey. So 40% uh, of the responders said that they had already implemented practices to increase soil carbon, and 69% said they were planning to implement further activities on their farm in the future, which is great. 
uh, crop rotations, tree planting, composting, planting legumes and crop and grazing management were some of the examples planned uh, to improve soil carbon. 37% said that they had tested for soil carbon on their farm in the past and 58% use fertilisers on their soils currently with the majority using a synthetic fertiliser. Quite a few responders said that they used fairly basic methods of collecting and storing data. However, there were also a number of people who used consultants to assist them and ag tech software applications. Most people registered for this workshop to first get a better understanding of carbon farming and soil health. Um, also to find out what activities might work on their farm and to find out who to contact to get help with planning to start their own projects. So thank you so much for filling out the survey. It allows us to know what to focus on during these workshops and plan for future events. We'll be sending out a short post event survey to gather feedback specifically about this event. So thank you in advance for filling that in. Speaking with and surveying our network members and with over 130 registrations for this workshop, it is clear that there is a huge interest in carbon farming and specifically about where to start and who to talk to. We have invited the following speakers to share their knowledge and experiences to help you move forward with your next project. We'll start with Carla Swift from the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development over here in Western Australia, who will be discussing carbon farming and the Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program. Followed by Louise Edmonds from Carbon Sink, who will be speaking to specific carbon farming projects in the Peel and Southwest regions of Western Australia. Wes Lawrence is the founder of Axis Tech, and he will be discussing methods of how to collect soil data um, and use what the latest technology is and how to store and then use that data in relation to carbon farming. Jenny Clawson, uh, a soil scientist at the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, will then look at on-farm activities to improve soil health and the importance of carbon in our soils. And Dan Hester will take us on a virtual field walk discussing the soil carbon project he is running with Meat and Livestock Australia to see how biomineral fertilizers, fertilizers affect the soil carbon sequestration rates compared to conventional fertilizers. Okay, so let's get into it. I would like to welcome our first speaker this afternoon, Carla Swift. So my name's Carla Swift. Um, um, part of the Low Carbon Futures team at the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. And um, I'm part of the WA Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program, which I will um, discuss with you today. I'm just going to provide an overview today. It's a, um, it's a quite a um, big topic. And so I'm just gonna try and present the key aspects. We can go to the next slide. So just a bit of an overview, big picture for um, carbon farming. Um, considering the net zero commitments globally, um, as you're all aware, there's, there are strong market drivers now for um, carbon neutrality and carbon credits across many industry sectors, um, agriculture being one of them. And um, but fortunately for agriculture, um, it's one industry sector that can generate its own carbon credits. And um, so therein lies the key opportunity with carbon farming. And so carbon farming, um, by definition of what we're going to discuss today, um, is land management activity that actively sequesters carbon in vegetation and soil, um, or activity that avoids the release of greenhouse gases. And we're also talking about carbon farming in the context of activity um, that is intending to generate Australian carbon credit units. And just to clarify um, what we're clearly talking about today, because there's a lot of discussion um, around carbon footprints. So we're talking about carbon farming versus carbon footprint. So just quickly again, carbon farming, we're aiming to store or avoid greenhouse emissions in return for generating carbon credits. Um, we're trying to um, 
generate a tradable commodity. We're helping meet the growing demand for offsets, um, entering into that supply versus demand as um, pressures are likely to grow in demand um, for those carbon credits over time. And also um, as a farmer, you are um, improving your ability to leverage um, external and other funding sources to address existing um, land issues that you may have, um, including salinity, soil health or loss of biodiversity. Um, and just as in compared to carbon footprint, carbon footprint and the language around that, we're talking more about measuring the emissions on your farm, um, trying to achieve that carbon neutrality, um, carbon calculators. So um, carbon footprint relates more to um, the future uh, product market demands and opportunities. So ensuring that your enterprise and your product in your industry sector are maintaining access to those global markets. You're addressing that those demands from the global supply chains um, where if everyone's trying to achieve carbon neutrality, people are wanting to do business with other businesses that um, are carbon neutral or have products that are demonstrated to be carbon neutral. So you're also meeting the expectations of consumers. That's, um, as we know, it's gone beyond our clean and green now into um, mainstream expectation um, that agricultural produce is working towards being carbon neutral. And also calculating farm emissions helps inform your own farm practice to um, practice changes towards reducing emissions on your farm. So just a quick overview, carbon farming projects. So um, once again, they are land management activities which create carbon credits by storing carbon in vegetation and soil over the long term. So these are a long term commitment to a project um, with a permanence period of either 25 or 100 years, um, mostly 25 for soil projects. And um, so one tonne of your carbon dioxide equivalent stored on your farm is equals one Australian carbon credit unit, also known by the acronym ACU. Um, your, so the Emissions Reduction Fund, known as the ERF, is the Australian Carbon Credit Scheme and projects are registered with the ERF by the Clean Energy Regulator and the Clean Energy Regulator issues your ACUs. ACUs um, are a tradable financial product, government issued and, and verified as such. The ACUs can be sold to Australian businesses to offset their greenhouse gas emissions, can be held as an asset by you or used to offset emissions for your own business. There are other non-ERF um, schemes um, such as a gold standard, which is an in international scheme. Um, just a quick note too, because a question I'm often asked is that um, it's not at this point in time essential to have ACUs to um, actually verify your carbon neutrality of your business. Um, but ACUs, are, I think, will be an important um, tool in the future for that for that end. But there are other um, certification programs, such as, for an example, Climate Active, which is a partnership between Australian government and businesses to certify carbon neutral businesses. Um, but having said that, you're, either way, um, you're going to probably upskill in the measurement and sequestration of carbon. So that's a good thing. So why get involved in carbon farming? We're taking the approach um, here in Western Australia agriculture um, that the new, the new and diversified revenue stream that's possible from um, generating carbon credits is the icing on the cake. But the real benefits to you as a farmer um, for a soil project are the increases in agricultural productivity that you may benefit from, um, from having um, increased your soil organic carbon. Um, and obviously your, the other soil health benefits that go with that. Um, you're also providing, uh, if it's a vegetation project, you will be helping provide shelter belts for stock and windbreaks and improving the microclimate on your farm. You'll be helping to tackle land degradation, salinity and erosion issues if you have those and in your landscape and helping restore the landscape with um, by improving biodiversity values and connectivity in the landscape. And there may also be other potential spin-offs such as um, farm forestry projects, uh, for example, the biofuels industry to, to um, generate biodiesel and, and aviation fuel is starting to look up. And so there are potential crossovers where they could be carbon projects at the same time. So what, just a quick overview, because I, I don't want to run over time, but what type of projects are there? So um, the main, there are a lot of um, methodologies in 
uh, approved by the Emission Reduction Fund nationally and not all of them apply well to Western Australia. So um, the two that the Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program have so far worked with mostly um, are refo reforestation by environmental or mallee plantings and the soil organic carbon um, method, which is um, measure, the new 2021 method. Um, there are also reforestation and afforestation new farm forestry plantations and plantation forestry methods that can be applicable in Western Australia. And also hopefully by the end of this year or early 2023, there'll be an integrated farm method where um, soil and vegetation projects can be combined, um, known as a stacking method. And that's um, a good saving for people who want to do both types of projects so that you just uh, reduce costs and time for one set of administration and reporting for that project. There are also emission avoidance projects that reduce methane, which I, I won't speak to, but just to mention them, the um, dairy and cattle feed supplements, effluent management and beef herd management in the north. So the Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program itself um, has um, emerged out of the West Australian State Climate Strategy. Its focus is on the Southwest Land Division of Western Australia. So that's that lovely line um, from Northampton to Esperance. Um, so the um, broadacre agricultural areas, but this particular program doesn't include the pastoral areas. Um, it's um, helping Western Australia to realise its emerging potential in, in this new market sector. Um, carbon farming can play an important role in, the, in both the financial and the climate resilience of agriculture and improving agricultural productivity over the long term. And as I said before, it can help address other issues that um, are existing um, through past clearing of agricultural land, such as dry land salinity, loss of biodiversity, um, declining soil health or erosion. So um, we are, this program help, is helping to overcome barriers to, to entry and engaging with carbon farming by providing some financial support for startup of projects um, and looking for early adopters who are keen um, to engage with carbon farming um, to help show the way. The key principles, just something to note um, with this program is it's designed to integrate carbon farming, soil and vegetation projects into existing farm activities. So we're maintaining the integrity of farming communities and the WA agricultural industry. Um, so with a vegetation project, you might want um, revegetate an area that's not um, overly productive for other land uses, thereby you're increasing the value and productivity of that part of your farm. So we're integrating into existing agricultural land and not replacing arable land. The Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program, um, as I said before, the, the real benefits um, are, the, are these co-benefits and um, so that with five key benefits have been identified and as a proponent um, to the Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program, you would select the appropriate co-benefits to be delivered by your project. So if you were wanting to deliver, um, to undertake a soil project, the main co-benefits that you would deliver on and document in your project um, would be agricultural productivity and soil health co-benefits. If you were undertaking a vegetation pro project, um, you'd be focusing on benefits one and four for biodiversity and conservation and possibly salinity mitigation co-benefits and Aboriginal economic and cultural co-benefits. Um, we're looking to integrate into the program wherever it's appropriate um, through Ab Ab Aboriginal co um, corporations who own and man manage land and um, via any employment opportunities or alignment with cultural values. So if, for example, with um, vegetation projects in particular, we have some fantastic um, Aboriginal rangers groups with, with really good green skills in seed collection, plant propagation and so forth. So um, there are, are potential ways to, um, to be involved. Next slide. The Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program, um, round one um, has closed and round one projects are getting underway soon. Um, there are three funding streams. We're hoping that round two will be available uh, in the next couple of months. Um, the, the three funding streams are ACU plus A, and that stands for obviously ACU plus the co-benefits I talked about. ACU plus A uh, is for projects that are intending to register as carbon credit projects with the Emissions Reduction Fund. That can be vegetation or soil projects. 
um, they're intending to deliver ACCUs and there's um, ACCUs are projects um, start up, um, uh, apply for startup funding support and that's then repaid um, in the form of some a small proportion of the ACCUs that that project generates over the time. Um, you're also obviously delivering those co-benefits an ACU plus B funding stream, um, a similar arrangement that's specifically for soil carbon projects only and in low rainfall zones of less than 350 millimetres um, growing season rainfall. The um, philosophy behind this stream is to um, help um, lower the risk for um, low rainfall zone soil projects. So um, providing data and proof of concept, um, intending to deliver ACCUs and also delivering those productivity and soil health co-benefits. Um, future carbon stream um, is uh, for non-ARF projects, so people who aren't trying to register carbon credit projects. They're wanting to undertake pilots and trials for innovative new ag practices, which they feel are going to, there's good scientific evidence that they're going to sequester more carbon and hopefully become um, able to become new ERF methods. And um, so Future Carbon is about building and sharing knowledge. So in exchange for the funding, you'd be sharing the knowledge and data comes out of that project for the benefit of the entire sector. Just a quick one, we won't, we won't stay on this map, but just showing the um, boundaries for um, ACU plus B and, and uh, reiterating again that the focus is um, on the data and co-benefits, encouraging farmers to participate, helping to cover the um, sampling costs um, and set up costs for those projects. And um, projects can be revoked in time if the um, carbon isn't realised, but um, there's still a, definitely a lot of potential in, in that rainfall zone. So AccuPlus um, quickly um, are looking for um, proponents who are small, medium or large farm entities um, and also can be groups of farmers. There's um, a requirement for a co-contribution of um, minimum of 30%. So um, we're looking for people who are um, you know, genuinely wanting to invest in this um, themselves, their, their, their time, skills um, and money to get these projects started. Um, the projects must not have started um, before you register with the Clean Energy Regulator and projects do need to be registered with the Clean Energy Regulator before a funding agreement is signed with the Carbon Farming and Land Restoration Program. So those two activities will be concurrent as you apply for um, the program, you will also be pursuing your um, registration with the Clean Energy Regulator so that that project can start. It's very important that physical activity of the project doesn't start before you've tried to register the project. The project needs to be able to generate ACUs and needs, must use an approved ERF carbon sequestration method for soil or vegetation. Um, and also recently the um, department um, ran a Carbon for Farmers voucher program, which is just closed, would be hoping to run another uh, later in the year. Um, but that program is to uh, help assist with the cost of pre-project advice for farmers so that um, to attract good quality applications. Um, quickly, project applications will include um, an estimate of a uh, calculation, I should say, of the number of ACCUs being offered in exchange for the funds, a focus on farming activities that produce carbon, my, um, your milestones for payment and delivery, and an, an outline of your co-benefits, how they'll be measured, monitored and reported on, and a proposal for the, the funding agreement contract term you'd like to um, have, which is usually between seven and 10 years. So just a quick overview of how it works, um, just for illustrative purposes. So for example, if you were to apply for um, and be successful, for example, $150,000 upfront project costs, you will then um, agree to return um, a number of ACUs at an agreed price, which includes the your perceived value of your co-benefits that, that that project's offering. So um, if you receive that, that funding, then um, at about a three to five year mark, you will take your first measurement of carbon and that's when the Clean Energy Regulator will issue your ACUs. So there is a delay in return of ACUs being issued. That's um, because carbon does tend to ebb and flow and it's, it's averaged out over a few years. Um, and other speakers will hopefully speak to that in more detail. But then you would um, you would conservatively estimate the amount of carbon and ACUs that your um, project is going to deliver. You would aim to, um, to repay 
the agreed amount of ACCIs over within that first five year, within that first measurement period, and then all excess and future ACCIs are yours to keep for the, for the remainder of that 25 year project cycle um, for you to hold as an asset or keep to buffer against any losses of carbon in that time um, or sell out to the secondary market with alongside your verified co-benefits. So you'll have a quality ACCI there um, available to you. Um, also, or you could use them for that future certification for sustainable um, or carbon neutral status or to offset your own farm emissions. So why start a soil carbon farming project? Um, I, I know that I'm reiterating these points, but um, they are the main points. It's not all just about ACCUs. The, the soil sampling, um, which measures a change of soil organic carbon, also provides information to you about soil nutrition and health. So you're building your skills in that area um, as as a, as a side sideline of, of into, into these projects. Your um, increasing soil carbon has benefits for your agricultural productivity and the resilience in the face of climate change. So whilst the, um, having those actions there may help future-proof your business um, as carbon markets become constrained, there are um, other um, good reasons to be involved. So participating in the Emissions Reduction Fund, I think um, other, um, Louise will probably speak about this as well. So I'll just um, cover that quickly. So to generate ACCUs, you do need to be in, in the Emissions Reduction Fund scheme um, for a soil carbon project, um, which today's um, workshop is mainly about soil. Um, you'll need to undertake good quality planning. So look at your feasibility, eligibility, capability in your business, um, all eligible interest holders with rights to that land for the, for the period of the, the permanence period. You, um, it's important to seek good advice, legal, tax and financial advice, um, speak to agronomists and a carbon service provider. Um, and also for soil projects, you need to produce a land management strategy to be able to register your project with the Clean Energy Regulator. So then you would be registering your project with the Clean Energy Regulator. And it's important to, as I said before, to do that first before you physically start your project. So before you introduce that new or different land management practice that's going to sequester more carbon and before you take your baseline samples, um, you need to register your project because they um, you need to start from square one with your measurement. Well, um, also start the project, then you would start the project activities and deliver on those project activities um, and then um, at least once every five years you'd be reporting to the clean energy regulator and claiming those ACCUs um, and then maintaining carbon levels for 25 years actually a little bit longer than 25 years because I think it's 25 years from that first measurement so um, there's your long-term commitment so just to go into uh, a little bit more discussion about your land management strategy. As I said, it's required for clean energy regulator registration of soil projects. And um, it really is a useful document. It helps the landholder understand how they're going to integrate carbon sequestration into their farming system, um, and that your particular farming system, your particular enterprise type, you need to choose a new or different um, land management activity that's going to, that's got scientific a validation that it's likely is likely to sequester more carbon than you've got now so that your carbon stock will increase over time um, so that has to be relevant and work with your business structure and your broader business objectives so your land management strategy is the opportunity to do your planning and, and look at all of that so it will also describe the new or materially different activity that you're proposing to undertake that will store carbon and in the methodology there's a list of eligible and ineligible activities. Um, it will describe how you intend to maintain that activity over the permanence period and also um, you'll look at any of the risks and just show that you've reviewed them and are aware and have a mitigation strategy. Um, the Clean Energy Regulator website provides a good guide on the requirements of what it needs in the LMS and also um, the department has developed a template with additional information that integrates those co-benefit requirements into your land management strategy. So that's actually um, a, would end up being a really good quality document um, for helping you apply for the Carbon Farming Land Restoration Program as well. So just, I'm just going to quickly review these because I've covered most of it and probably close to time. But um, so planning a project. So things to look at, key things. Do you want to do a soil or a vegetation project or integrate both? 
and then you'll start talking to the um, people who can help offer advice on both of those projects. Look at the feasibility. Can you create enough carbon to make it worthwhile uh, learning all those the new skills and administration? Um, and look at the cost versus returns. Um, if done well, um, there are plenty of benefits and returns, um, some of them directly financial and some uh, more indirect, as we discussed. Um, look at your eligibility, eligibility for clean energy regulator registration um, and the eligible interest holders consent. So just, just bearing in mind that that's a long-term project. So anyone else who has an interest in your land or is part of your trust or um, banks or anyone any other parties um, need to be, you need to have their um, consent to undertake a project that's long term like that. Um, just given the fact that you've got to maintain that carbon stock on that land for that period of time. So you'll then look at your capability. So do you have the knowledge, skills and resources within your existing farm business to undertake that project? Um, and or do you have those um, skills and resources within your existing consultant network. So do a bit of a skills reconnaissance, look at um, what, what skills you've got, what skills you need to bring in to help you um, to manage and develop this project. Um, decide on who's the proponent. So the proponent will actually be registering with the Clean Energy Regulator and they will hold the ACUs. So that uh, for most soil projects that, that will be um, the farmer on whose land that project is but it can also be um, a project developer who's working with a group of farmers and then um, they might hold the ACUs and then there are um, really good uh, legal arrangements in place for how to distribute those ACUs um, amongst the different landholders in the group. Um, and look at who's responsible for tasks such as coordinating soil sampling or tree planting. And just so, you know, if you're working with a carbon service provider, um, you you need a clear indication of, of who's actually coordinating and managing most of the project. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then, as I said before, look at the long-term integration of those projects into your farming business. Because there might be other, uh, once you start to give it some good thought in, and consideration and planning, you might find that it, it meets a lot of different goals um, concurrently to be undertaking that project. So just on, um, a final note about working with carbon service providers and project developers, because this is a question we're asked a lot and uh, sort of decided to address it in the presentation. So it, it is possible to, to do it yourself if you're really keen um, for the landholder to manage all the aspects and phases of project development and implementation. It can work if you've got the right staff already in your business um, with good administration skills or you've got um, someone with you know soil carbon or environmental skills and they've got time to work on the project it can it can work but in most cases you will um, need to work with a carbon service provider at least for some of the specific skills um, that you need such as helping you know your planning and feasibility and, and um, carbon measuring and estimating so um, you might want to partner with a carbon service provider or a project developer and uh, they can either provide that support for specific phases so they could come in and help plan and then come back when it's in three to five years when it's time to measure or they may get um, very involved at providing a full service and run, they might run that project from planning right through the sale of ACUs on, on your behalf. So if you're using a carbon service provider, um, then that enables you um, as a landholder to focus on the core business of running your farm and um, your main obligation then being to maintain that carbon sequestering activity on, on your farm and um, help protect that carbon stock. Once ACUs have been issued for that carbon, you've got to need to protect it for the permanence period of the project to, um, so it's a legitimate carbon credit and that carbon is there stored on that farm. So, um, so farmers already, as you know, there are expert topic experts um, already involved in your business and you consult them and um, in good faith and because they have specialist skills so that you don't have to be a, an expert on, on everything. Um, so carbon service providers are another specific service. And um, but having said that, it is important that um, as a landholder, you always understand your own obligations and what's involved. And just a little bit more on that, um, so carbon service providers are private businesses, so um, look for experience and qualifications when working with carbon service provider. Um, they can help with the planning feasibility and carbon estimation, help with project registration and auditing and reporting for the clean energy regulator. 
and they may also provide valuable links to other carbon related um, advice services so illegal or financial who who have existing experience um, in other states or so forth with um, carbon projects so um, as far as the operating stru structure some carbon service providers will provide that fee for service so if your landholders wants to manage retain most of the control of the project um, then you'll just might pay a fee for service for that provider to come in and do specific um, stages of the project to provide services or um, the carbon service provider might manage that project for a percentage of the ACUs which seems to generally as a generalization range from between five and thirty percent um, and there are actually pros and cons to both these structures so I don't um, there's not there's not a, a correct solution because actually um, partnering long term with a carbon service provider does give them that incentive to manage your project long term so because considering that in five years time you, you might want to measure it again and then in another five years time so you've actually got that that um, partnership for the long term um, whereas for other landholders it may feel better to you to use a fee for service provider and um, that's okay too so um, consider who's carrying carrying the risk for the project um, so the higher the percentage of of the accus that a carbon service provider um, may build into that project with you the more risk and responsibility that you would expect them to carry whereas if you're um, just getting a bit of advice from a carbon service provider then you're retaining that control and responsibility yourself um, just as a note, carbon service providers in the carbon farming and land restoration program, so any carbon service providers who are um, providing services for, for those projects, they um, must be a signatory of the car to the Carbon Market Institute's Industry Code of Conduct. Um, the Carbon Mar Market Institute's website has a list on that website of, of um, service providers who are um, signatory to that code of conduct. and. The, um, that's really just because we're trying to build a solar foundation here for a strong strong foundation for a new and emerging industry sector. So we're wanting to work with those carbon service providers who are committed to their own industry sector for that code of conduct. Um, also, um, just recently with the voucher program, um, we've we've compiled a list of service of service provider directory, and um, that leads us that will lead us to our next speaker, Louise, who's on that. Um, provider directory and listed as available to help develop um, projects. So just for a um, final slide, uh, do we have time for questions now, Hannah, or at the end? Yes, we do have um, just a very short amount of um, time for questions. The first one was from Tony. Um, which term applies to an ACU 25 or 100? So um, most soil projects are 25 year uh, permanency period. And I think the vegetation projects um, are, t are 25 or 100. Um, from Mel, is there any scope in the future to reduce the red tape associated with audits, reporting associated with the methods through CER? In my experience, the costs are too high to register any projects in the Southwest due to the general small scale of farms, not achieving the minimum 2,000 tonnes required for the project? Uh, so the question was about, is that going to change? Yeah, is there any scope in the future? Um, I, would, I would hope so. I can't, I can't probably fully answer that. It's, it's probably a question for the clean energy regulator themselves. Um, but it, it's, it, is definitely, it is definitely in discussion. And uh, I guess that's one of the reasons we're trying to develop um, me new methods as well that are relevant for, for Western Australia's um, not conditions as well as size. Amanda, uh, why do they only accept projects that have not started yet? Okay, good question. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> we get so many inquiries from um, farmers, from good early adopters who've got, um, you know, been working with their soil carbon for years and have got lots of re good revegetation projects on their farm. Um, but the way the, the, the carbon credit system really works is you're actually drawing down that carbon in real time for while it's also being emitted. So if someone's purchasing that carbon credit, um, this probably isn't the perfect explanation, but you know they're they're out there emitting, and at the same time you're drawing it down. So it's um, 
on a temporal scale, you're actually doing it at the same time. So, um, so while so if you were trying to um, sell credits for carbon that's already there, it that it just doesn't equate. And so, um, I, I was one of those people standing in the paddock twenty years ago, farmers saying you'll get credits for this one day. Um, and but the way it's administered, um, when you break it down, it actually does make sense. And also, you haven't started your project just because it's um, there's just it's considered an investment decision to start that project. So you you register, um, it's it, the registration ticks there, and then you say right now from this point forward, we change the management activity, we plant the trees, we introduce the new fertilizer pasture. Um, whatever the soil regime is that your new activity and then so you do a baseline measurement on that soil and then go from that point forward with the new activity. Great thank you for answering those questions Carla. There are a couple more but I'm mindful of the time. If we can get to them at the end of the presentation we will. If not I'll get Carla to answer those via email and send that out to everyone. Thanks so much, Thanks. Carla. Um, a great introduction to our workshop on carbon farming and um, also how to work with those carbon service providers to make sure you get the best out of your project and you can run with it um, and it to their success. Um, thank you so much for being involved and hopefully we have some time at the end to answer those final couple of questions. Louise Edmonds is our next speaker and um, Carla referred to her and her company CarbonSync um, as one of the carbon service providers that the department um, has listed on their service providers website. Um, she will be discussing her organisation's role in carbon farming projects and provide examples of how farmers can get started and how uh, and case studies of past farmers that have done the work already. Thank you Louise, over to you. Thank you very much Hannah and um, Mick for inviting me to come and speak today and also uh, to Carla, you've covered some a, a lot of ground <laughs> making my job much easier, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm just going to present my screen. Okay, um, so I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, hopefully allowing 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, Carbon Sync is a uh, carbon farming project developer. We work in uh, cropping and grazing systems in the agricultural estates of Western Australia. Um, and we will be launching um, down in the southwest, um, mainly in grazing very soon. So this is just to give you an indication of what a carbon farming project service provider the roles that a service provider might play. Um, we are a full service uh, uh, project developer. We perform the role of an agent. Um, so the agent is the person who registers the project on your behalf and liaises with uh, the regulator around the compliance obligations of that project. We also perform the function of a proponent um, and we carry uh, much of the risk of the project on your behalf. We're also an agricultural education service. So our focus is to support farmers to implement holistic and regenerative agricultural management practices. So we teach you about the emerging science around these practices and support you with the technical execution of those practices on your farm um, to ensure that you actually do achieve the sequestration outcomes. We work at scale. Um, our first project will be launching on 20,000 hectares. Um, and that enables us to bring together uh, quite a large pool of carbon credits um, and market those carbon credits to some of the very large emitters. So uh, we have a very experienced team. Um, our senior team, made of, of myself, the founder and CEO of Carbon Sync, George Bray, who's our CTO. Um, there is a lot of technology involved in soil carbon farming projects. Essentially, carbon credits and ecosystem services are data products um, and the collection um, at storage um, and analysis of that data is actually what generates value for you. So this is a very important role. Um, we also have a significant research and development agenda. Our focus will be on applied research in whole systems farming operations um, to determine what 
works here um, and hopefully we can accelerate people's learning and adoption and success in these projects. Um, Dr Chris Nichols um, started her career in the, in the Dakotas in the US um, and has recently just finished her work as the Chief Scientific Officer of the Rodale Institute in the US. We also have Kevin Elmy. Kevin Elmy is a regenerative cropping cropper from um, Canada. Uh, he also established a cover crop seed business. Um, he's an author, um, consultant and speaker and educator uh, who's working all over the world at present. And then we have Brian Welberg, who's a holistic management educator. 20 years of experience, fantastic um, person Brian is. And then we have on the finance, um, governance and legal side uh, coming soon from the clean energy regulator, a senior manager who uh, actually administered the soil carbon project within uh, the clean energy regulator. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, you might be interested to know that there are actually 267 soil carbon projects registered in Australia and they make up 23% of all emissions reduction fund project registrations. Um, we're expecting that they will grow, continue to grow significantly. Um, there is quite a history in soil carbon methods in Australia. The first method came out in 2014, then another method 2016, 2018, and most recently the 2021 method. Um, so Australia is the only country in the world with a nationally legislated um, compliance market um, in the carbon space. Um, and our project, our, our uh, soil carbon projects are considered uh, some of the most rigorous um, uh, methods in the world. So what do we actually do? Um, we provide farmers with the tools to manage ecosystem health support farmers to collect the data to prove the enhancement of the health of their ecosystem and help them get rewarded for best practice land stewardship. And we provide um, a variety of tools to farmers um, to assist in this. So I'm just going to go briefly through those tools. So uh, our program sits on holistic management. So holistic management is, uh, was established by Alan Savory, um, a Zimbabwean um, game rancher and um, biologist uh, about 40 years ago. It's essentially uh, a decision-making framework that supports you to make decisions towards your personal goals. But also included in that framework are various planning tools. So holistic planned grazing, some people might refer to it as mob grazing or um, rotational grazing. Uh, there's many ways to describe a, a similar uh, a kind of grazing. Uh, financial planning, land planning and ecological monitoring. Uh, our program uh, is a very hands-on. Um, we are uh, boots on the ground. <laughs> uh, we work uh, intensively with our with our um, the farmers in our in our in our uh, cohorts, um, and we have some fantastic people supporting our farmers. So Blythe Kalman, she is a beef producer herself, um, very experienced. She's a holistic management trainer, educator, um, exceptionally skilled in low stress stock management, and Brian Welberg. Uh, he came from Zimbabwe as well. He's been living in Australia for over 20 years. Um, he started in very large cropping uh, uh, operations in Zimbabwe, grazing and also um, game, game reserves, wildlife reserve management. Uh, and then in Australia, he's managed some very large um, cattle properties in Queensland, but has been predominantly training for the last 20 years. We also teach KLR marketing. Um, this is about uh, managing grass, money and livestock. So, you know, your assets as a grazier are always moving between those three pools. Um, and it's about uh, moving your asset to ensure that you maintain the health of your ecosystem and also doing that in such a way that's profitable. Low stress stock handling. So, of course, most farmers are, are, are very, very skilled at, at this. Um, what we find is some of the management te 
techniques that we um, promote can change the behaviour of animals. And so um, just to support that transition, we help farmers to understand that changed behaviour and manage the animals accordingly. Uh, we also know that farmers like to learn from farmers. Um, there's lots of social media tools that people use, um, Twitter, um, WhatsApp, um, Facebook, um, but we've actually decided that we are going to build our own custom-made social media network. Um, no advertising, um, you'll, you'll have privacy in there, you can create your own peer groups, um, you know, share your stories, record your stories, uh, and also speak to other um, people through those other mediums as well. So proving it. This is exceptionally important. Uh, there are so many land managers out there who are doing amazing work. Um, they're seeing their land regenerate in front of their eyes. Um, you know, and often when they tell that story, it isn't recognised because the data to prove that those uh, regenerative outcomes have been achieved um, doesn't exist or is not in a standard that the market values. Um, so we uh, focus very uh, strongly on monitoring um, the health of the ecosystem uh, to ensure that those that work is recognised and the farmers receive uh, compensation um, uh, for, for the very important work that they're doing. So the first um, tool that we use is called natural capital accounting. Very simply, natural capital accounting adds the health of the ecosystem to the balance sheet. Uh, it's done in a very scientific way. What it uh, does is it enables you as a farmer to understand how your investment in your farm ecosystem is affecting your balance sheet. Um, how this can be monetized in a few ways. Um, predominantly at the moment, we're seeing it monetized through reductions in interest rates uh, for financing products um, and uh, reductions in premiums for insurance products. Uh, it's also used to validate um, ecosystem outcomes for emerging ecosystem services markets in uh, biodiversity and, and, and other domains. Um, it's also an accountability tool for us. Um, we're very serious about our, our, our commitments to our farmers um, and the best way that we can demonstrate that we are achieving what we set out to achieve is to monitor that. Um, and um, yeah, it, it keeps us accountable to our commitments to farmers. So the other tool, um, there are many tools um, that can be used to support your enterprise. For graziers, we're using Maya Grazing. Um, it enables you to um, track the performance of your herd, uh, the profitability of your grazing enterprise, as well as the productivity of uh, your, your pastures in real time. Um, and it's an excellent feedback loop uh, uh, for graziers um, to see how they're doing. It also supports us um, in our uh, re reporting requirements um, to the Clean Energy Regulator. So, um, ecosystem health. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we do an enormous amount of monitoring above and beyond the requirements of the soil carbon sequestration method. Uh, ecological outcome verification is a grassland or pasture uh, monitoring protocol. We set up um, uh, uh, monitoring sites uh, and we monitor um, that those the performance of your 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 pastures. So it also um, acts as a rapid feedback loop for you uh, and and understanding how your management is is um, progressing the health of the ecosystem. And this feeds into a global brand, which I'll talk to in a few minutes. So getting rewarded, that's that's what we all essentially want. Um, and there are many ways that you can be rewarded um, through a, a soil carbon farming program. And I'll just talk a little bit about how we see um, that coming together. So firstly, as Carla said, rightfully said, um, the major gains that you will uh, get will be in the improved profitability of your farm enterprise. 
Uh, we expect that that pr improved profitability will come from reducing your cost of production, um, uh, increasing the resilience, and in particular, smoothing out those interannual variabilities that we often encounter in, in, a, in a constrained environment. Um, and that, that's, that's where we see the major gains coming from you, coming for you. Of course, <laughs> there's income from carbon credit, uh, carbon credits and ecosystem service payments. Um, and this income is significant, it can be very significant. <laughs> um, so, uh, and the ecosystem service payments is something that's uh, emerging. Um, the federal government has come out with their Australian Biodiversity Stewardship Scheme and um, farmers are just starting to be paid um, under that scheme. Then we have re uh, regenerative branding premiums, which I'll talk to in a minute, and carbon neutral status, something that Carla was speaking about. So um, the producers of our commodity products, in particular um, our grains, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the purchasers, are asking questions about the greenhouse gas status of those products. Um, and through our program, we can uh, very clearly um, define uh, what the greenhouse gas uh, status is and we can offset those um, greenhouse gas emissions if required by a purchaser, um, creating possibly a premium or some kind of, kind of uh, market advantage for uh, partic participants in our program. And as I mentioned earlier, um, risk adjusted discounts on finance, uh, financing interest rates and, and insurance products as well. So market recognition, there are various brands that are, that are seeking regenerative um, products. So many of you may know the Perth-based Dirty Clean Food, who are always looking for um, regeneratively produced uh, product. Um, there's also a company in Perth called Latitude 28, who is doing some great work with a direct-to-consumer beef product into China. And as Carla spoke earlier, um, we have the Climate active, active Program of the Australian Government. Um, this is a rapidly growing program um, that is sourcing ACUs um, for products and for businesses. Um, we can also support you in obtaining that accreditation as well. Uh, and finally, um, the eco Ecological Outcome Verification. Um, the brand that is associated with that is called Land to Market. It's a global brand um, and that brand is seeing huge food producers such as Mars, Applegate, um, uh, General Mills, um, and then of course food fiber, um, Caring, which is the company that sources uh, leather and fiber for the big brands like Gucci, Louis Vuitton. Um, these um, companies are pr procuring from this brand now uh, in Australia as well. So it's pretty exciting. So uh, that's really the end of my presentation. Um, the expressions of interest are open for uh, Carbon Sinks program now. You can find them on the website, carbonsink.com.au. Um, just a couple of other things. Uh, Carbon Sink is a signatory to the um, Australian Carbon Code of Con Conduct. Uh, as Carla mentioned, we're also um, registered for the Carbon for Farmers voucher program. Um, and we can support you with all the requirements of that as well. So, um, yeah, if you've applied and you'd like to learn more about what we offer for that, please get in touch. Um, my telephone number is there. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Louise, for uh, going through what you your part to a carbon farming project and the benefits of uh, going through a carbon service provider. Um, we have a couple of questions for you, Louise. Um, the first one from Tony. Um, Louise, do you still get commission even if carbon levels fall due to drought or other um, reasons? Yeah, so we operate in a partnership and co-investment model with the farmer. Um, our projects are designed that we stay with the farmer for the full 25 years of the permanence requirement of the project. Um, so if the farmer does not achieve the sequestration outcomes, then we don't get paid. <laughs> so we've seriously got skin in the game in this, um, in, in, in our model. 
Do you complete carbon calcs as well? How do you go about setting up a project that is cross-measured, i.e. Techno technology that leads to soil carbon? And do you have to separate these two methods, i.e. two projects? Sure, okay, so um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna make a few assumptions there because I'm not fully clear. Um, but uh, our intent, what we're working on right now is doing the full uh, life cycle analysis of the properties that we work with before we start the project. So we know what the baseline situation for that property is in terms of its greenhouse gas footprint. Um, and in terms of uh, cross methods, so if the question is, do we do um, soil carbon and vegetation projects? Uh, we don't, uh, we are specialists in soil carbon, but if a um, farmer chooses, would like to do a vegetation method, we would bring in a, uh, a project proponent, uh, a project developer to, to help to develop that project. Um, do you have separate, yes, you, 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 have to, you have to manage two methods. You can't unfortunately bring them together yet, but the government is working on an integrated method that will hopefully make all of that much easier. Okay, and she's just elaborated. So we are looking at a biodigester that leads to organic fertilizer. Uh, okay, so um, you can only work create accus with a uh, approved method, um, and at this point in time, I'm not aware that there is a method that is approved for development of organic fertilizer, but certainly um, that would be a product that you could use uh, under the method in a project. And if you're making it on farm, that's fantastic. Do you find your customers are driven by making money from creating accus or are they driven by other factors? They're driven by a lot of factors. Uh, the primary factor that they're driven by is um, wanting to maintain a sustainable business into the future. Um, a recognition that the climate is changing and that our, our, uh, our farming practices will need to change um, to mitigate, mitigate against those changes. Um, also a recognition that um, markets are changing as well. So, you know, as we've spoken, you know, there is a carbon border um, adjustment mechanism that has just been put in place in the EU, which could see our agricultural exports um, taxed if they don't address their carbon, um, foot, their carbon footprint. So that's one thing. We know that's just around the corner. Um, you know, consumers are more interested in how their food is produced and the environmental impact of that. Um, farmers want to hand over a healthy, a healthy farm to their, the next generations. So there's many, many benefits of participating. Uh, I would say most definitely not um, interested only in money and in accus. Um, but of course, all of this stuff does pay. There is a strong, very strong business case uh, for participating in, in a soil carbon project. So it makes life um, much easier when, when, when they, everything works together. Wonderful. In relation to soil carbon farming projects, are these more suited to larger scale properties? And if so, from your experience, how many acres or hectares do you need to make a project worthwhile? Yes, so absolutely. Um, they, they are. And, and, and one of the reasons that we have project developers is that we need to do this at scale. So scale beyond the size of the farm, actually scale as in, you know, tens of thousands of hectares are required to make these projects work. Um, but that being said, um, we uh, Trying to stay above 500 hectares uh, per property, we're, we're, we're targeting a thousand, but we're looking at in the situations, so there are certain situations where we could accept a property that's down at 500 hectares. And of course, I realise that, you know, in many uh, contexts in grazing, you know, in the southwest, 500 hect hectares is quite large. But um, yes, scale is very important. Well, thank you so much, Louise. That's a great insight to what you do at Carbon Sync and um, how people can start progressing on their ideas to um, move into a carbon farming project. Our next speaker is Wes Lawrence. Um, 
a very good friend of Future Food Network, and he is an expert in data collection and management of that data. He's going to speak about what new technology is available to help with collecting data on soil health and specifically soil carbon. So thank you, Wes, over to you. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, and uh, thanks to the uh, Carla and Louise uh, for the previous presentations. And uh, great to be here. So a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in the great southern of WA um, on a mixed farming operation. Spent a bit of time working in tech and then founded Access Tech a few years ago. Uh, Access Tech is very much oriented around data and devices. Uh, we have some quite, um, quite neat data management tools and data collection and generation tools as well. Uh, why carbon? So I want to just zoom out a little bit and, uh, and just sort of have a quick look at carbon and the carbon cycle and, and, and what it is we're trying to achieve uh, in terms of carbon farming, carbon projects and so on. And, and fundamentally within carbon, there's two key cycles uh, that occur on different timescales. We've got a fast carbon cycle that's very much about plant photosynthesis and soil organic carbon sequestration and release. And then we have slow carbon cycles around ocean sedimentation and longer term cycles around fossil fuels. And one of the key challenges we have is a, uh, a driver that's been in our economy for a extended period of time, but very intense in the last 50 years around fossil fuels. So long carbon cycle uh, being, uh, uh, long cycle carbon being extracted uh, and consumed and released into the atmosphere. Um, and what we're trying to do is use fast carbon cycles in order to get that back into, uh, into soil and other places. So when we start looking at soil and agriculture, we're very much looking at um, those fast carbon cycles and the fundamental starting point with carbon, um, as, uh, as Louise mentioned, is about undertaking uh, an assessment or an audit of your own property to understand your carbon neutrality or otherwise. So you need to be able to achieve those goals of carbon neutral and support that within, uh, within your own business or within support of industries um, that are aiming at particular carbon targets. So Meat and Livestock Australia is CN30. Uh, so carbon neutral 30, basically that you're sequestering an equal amount of carbon to your own emissions. If you have a surplus, you are then looking to sell those emissions um, for the offset of the other, other emitters. When we drill down into soil organic carbon, we're looking at a very short cycle, um, a fast cycle of carbon and understanding that it is a cycle and there is varying states in which carbon exists. And there's key practice changes that can change the inputs and outputs. So the, the input of sequestration and release that occurs naturally within that cycle. And uh, I think we've got Jenny following up a little bit further and she'll probably speak a little bit more on that in terms of uh, soil health and improving soil health. Um, so on, on that, uh, it's important just to recognize, I think this has come up in a few questions, that uh, there's two key drivers behind measuring and monitoring carbon. One is around soil carbon quantification um, and, and anything in relation to a soil carbon quantification, uh, it's definitely worth getting advice, engaging a consultant or an advisor on the particular methodology that you're looking to use. In Australia, it's mostly around the uh, generating ACUs within the Clean Energy Regulator um, Emissions Reduction Fund. There's been lots of chatter recently about the Emissions Reduction Fund. The, my observation is the key chatter is about the lack of emissions reduction um, or the sort of green, grabbing some 
some carbon offsets from producers or somewhere else and applying them to emissions without actually genuinely reducing emissions. So I think that's sort of the, the key piece around the challenges or questions that have come up about that fund. Um, as, um, but there's a number of different sort of ways of, of engaging in carbon quantification and generating credits or saleable credits around those things. Um, if you're looking to do that, make sure that you're aligning with the requirements of those programs, which are very specific and have specific timeframes, as we've heard from Carla and Louise. The other part to it is soil health and soil management. And carbon is important, uh, vital even for soil health. Um, it is part of the soil structure. Uh, carbon improves the uh, moisture retention, it reduces erosion, uh, it helps with that conversion, the plant conversion uh, of nutrients into energy uh, and support for the plant, um, assists with the transfer of nutrients into plant and produce, um, and, uh, and is a key indicator of soil health. So it's sort of a marker. It's not the only thing about soil health as biology um, and, uh, and so on taking place. Um, but within that, uh, carbon is a key marker in relation to that. So if we're looking to uh, undertake a view of, of carbon and uh, with, with both of those things in mind, there's some key building blocks. And I want to introduce you to the Custodian Ag Buy Them Toolbox. So like a toolbox, uh, you open up your Synchrome Toolbox and you have tool sets within it um, where you know you have a socket set and a spanner set and a screwdriver set and so on and each has purposes and detail and so on so i'm operating at a, a reasonably high level in terms of this but there's drill down within each so the five m's are measurement management metrics method and monetization so measurement is really around uh, data gathering or data generation and, and I want to zoom out a little bit um, around carbon, but also identifying that carbon sits within a broader framework of sustainability. And that's important because while carbon's very, very topical at the moment, it hasn't always been, it is right now, it won't always be in the future. There's absolutely opportunities with carbon and carbon farming and um, generating financial revenues um, off, of, uh, off of carbon sequestration and being able to create carbon credits, sell those credits, absolutely. That won't always be the only driver. And in fact, it isn't the only driver, um, as Louise mentioned about natural capital accounting, financiers, lenders, buyers that are putting demands on the food and, food and beverage value chain around key attributes, um, you know, around nutrient density and so on, uh, or, or production or sustainability or, um, you know, animal welfare, uh, you know, all of these things are really important. You know, slavery within a supply chain, uh, these things are becoming increasingly important. So if we're looking to undertake activity, we need a broad enough scope that our activity is covering those things. So in terms of sustainability and measurement and good farm measurement generally aligns and good farm management generally aligns with those things. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, tools and technologies that can be used in terms of solving some of those challenges of time, distance and cost. When we come to measuring and monitoring soil, uh, there's some quite significant data sets available like the, the deeper data sets that are um, that uh, are available um, and uh, and within that uh, there's some key metrics and monitoring that can undertake within that GIS data so that's uh, globally positioned data uh, so that's one measurement of soil as we move into drilling down into soil carbon and measuring soil carbon uh, remote uh, satellite spatial sensing um, and there's a whole bunch of new and emerging technologies within that. Some are very um, are established, 
uh, there's key elements that are emerging around um, with uh, satellite imagery increasing resolution so that's sort of the size of the pixel within an image and increasing the multi-spectrum so using light and radiation spectrums in order to gain different understandings of soil properties remotely so spatial uh, data is awesome for scale but it still requires ground truthing because it is still data from a distance so when we move into measuring soil carbon uh, and ground truthing um, we have our traditional soil tests so that's a stock standard take your sample and um, and uh, send it in to the soil lab. The soil lab produces the outputs and measures according to key elements, uh, whether that's in relation to texture, chemistry, or organic carbon within soil. So within that, um, there's uh, a national soil strategy put together by the federal, uh, federal agricultural department, and there's work taking place around um, those soil historical soil records uh, being worth money and there's an, an um, a media release there around uh, some uh, some strategies and activities taking place uh, if you're interested in being connected in with the, what's emerging within that national soil strategy uh, and some of those um, uh, components around soil data then uh, register interest and we'll keep you in the loop as that evolves uh, other ground truthing methodologies. Um, so this is some technology that's being represented within some local companies. Uh, it's an international technology uh, coming out of the US uh, and it's running some near infrared. And it's a, the ability to create an understanding of soil organic carbon um, at a whole of paddock level. Uh, it's, it's a useful technology. Um, it has some limitations um, but it has the ability to uh, to be able to create some mapping and so on. Uh, another measurement technology I'd like to introduce you to is one that uh, we've been working on at Access Tech in collaboration with a local Perth company, Sensor C. Sensor C have undertaken some scientific work with some US universities around some key technology pieces, uh, the ability to rather than light spectrum as we were looking at before. Uh, this is working within the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so it's basically delivering AM and FM radio signals of, of specific types into the soil um, in order that it can receive a feedback loop on the constituents of the soil in terms of compounds and so on uh, and tune uh, according to its, um, to the key things it's listening into, tune to uh, soil organic carbon. Um, so if this is a, a reasonably extensive piece of work, it's quite a new technology and there'll be opportunities for to be involved in projects working with this um, in Q2 and Q3. Um, so, you know, that's pretty exciting as a remote, uh, remote monitoring capability um, deployed in soil in uh, generating an understanding of soil organic carbon. So that's all good in terms of measurement and generating data. Then there's key elements around managing that data and our experience in managing data within both carbon data and a broader context of farm data is it exists in a lot of different shapes and forms. Um, there's challenges around storage, there's challenges around standardization and data ownership and so on. And so we've gone about working um, in, uh, in terms of uh, creating a platform that addresses um, uh, trust and fairness uh, within data. We've built out a set of data standards to assist with that standardization. And we work within the framework of the fair data principles, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And so that reusability is really important. Um, it's the thing that drives multiple value returns around that data and using that data. Uh, so within that, 
um, within the data management platform, we're actually able to bring in all of those variety of data sets and create a data convergence that actually delivers multiple values and multiple benefits. So it can help mon manage carbon data, but importantly, it can help manage a broader business operation, uh, farming operation or other business type. Um, and this is a bit of transformation work that takes place uh, within that within that framework. Um, the ability to reuse that data within groups and create collaborative group projects on soil, soil health, soil data, uh, or other attributes uh, becomes part of the capability and part of that reuse of data. The drivers around creating on-farm automation or um, increasing levels of automation uh, automating the mundane and supercharging the complex, moving from human to machine assisted to machine across those aspects. And then driving uh, use of data within uh, key data science projects, um, like uh, there's a deeper project happening around uh, uh, soil Monte Carlo um, uh, data analysis and forecasting project with liming. Uh, so that's really, you know, some key pieces around soil and soil health um, and the ability to use these things, use this data to be able to assist and drive those projects. So within that, the um, measurement and management of that data is really important. We're then able to apply that into some metrics. And I want to introduce you to the Global Farm Metric. It's, uh, uh, it's coming out of the Sustainable Food Trust in the UK. It's a framework, uh, it's a very holistic framework of understanding sustainability and understanding uh, that broader context um, of what can be done with data and farm data. And you can see that soil organic matter forms a part of that overall framework of sustainability. Um, we're then able to drive a natural capital framework through operational data and uh, deliver some key outcomes with that. Method, uh, I think uh, Daniel's gonna really be talking to some of this. Uh, the concept of method is very much how to turn the dial. So that might be about how to improve nutrient use efficiency, how to improve water use efficiency, or how to turn the dial on that carbon sequestration level, improving soil health, um, maybe a transition from uh, uh, one farming method or system or applicant to another, really to try and turn the dial on those sustainability elements. And of course, monetization, where the return on investment is critical at each point in terms of that overall framework. Um, monetization of um, of farming and farm data, monetization of those that turning the dial and monetization of soil carbon and soil carbon measurements, um, whether that's through improved soil health that drives improved yield, improved soil health that drives better animal and livestock outcomes, or whether it's through uh, actually upskilling the ability to generate excess carbon and excess carbon sequestration for sale within ACU. So the, the ACU generating project is really about a long-term view of sequestering carbon, but the produce, the, the, there's a key driver there of actually undertaking that sequestering of carbon. And there's activities and monitoring and work required in order to be able to achieve that. And as uh, Carla mentioned, there's a skill set around that or learning and skill, skill upskill capability within that. Um, so in terms of that overall view, carbon and sustainability, uh, that 5M toolbox hopefully will be able to give you some guidance and framework and direction around not around uh, the data required for production and production systems, the ACUs and for soil health and sustainability. That's great. Thank you, Wes, um, for running through your the 5M toolbox. I love that. Um, and I always love your the FAIR data. 
how you explain that. Wonderful. But so exciting to hear about the remote monitoring technology that's in ground. What a great project. And um, hopefully we can follow along and share the good news um, about uh, the project. Um, we have uh, one question, I think. Yep, just one here. Um, so this is from Mel. Can you hold excess carbon to offset in another period? Uh, okay, so I think that might be a question in relation to an accu-driven project perhaps, or a, or a process of, of um, sort of carbon offsets. Um, so within that, I'll probably direct that question to someone with more skill or qualification around running a, a, an accu-driven carbon project. So, oh, there we go, Louise. Perhaps Thank Louise you. might be the one to answer that question. Yeah, no worries. Um, Yes, you can. <laughs> you can also, in, depending on who you're working with in our model, um, we set up what's called an annual account for the farmer and the carbon credits go into that account so that the farmer has the option to um, offset whenever they like and sell whenever they like. So, um, yeah, but it's important that your project is structured to enable that flexibility. Wonderful. Thanks, Louise, for jumping on. Um, while you're on, we actually have a, another question for, for you, Louise, um, that came in just at the start of Wes's talk. Um, can you provide examples of how many accus a farmer might get for their project? Do they need to have a minimum area of land available for planting or soil projects in order to make it feasible? Just wondering if you can share some examples. Okay, so the first um, ACUs issued under a soil carbon project in Australia were issued in 2019 um, on a dairy farm in East Gippsland with a rainfall, I think it was 650 mil rainfall zone. Well, I mean 900, anyway. <laughs> um, the, uh, the number of ACUs issued per hectare in the first year was uh, around 13 tonnes and the second year 14 tonnes. Um, so that's actually the only real data that we have. Um, but there is research that has been conducted over a long period of time in the United States. I know it's in the US, don't get scared. <laughs> um, but that data um, is demonstrating around a three ton carbon sequestration rate per hectare per year uh, sorry that's elemental carbon um, in rainfall zones between 250 and 1500 millimeters um, just a bit of a rider on that 15 years and you know with exceptionally good management in those systems um, so it could take some time to hit those kinds of targets um, when you're starting right from the beginning, but that's um, pretty much the best data that exists at the moment. Wonderful, thank you, Louise. Um, and Wes, thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's been great to have you in this workshop and uh, really looking forward to hearing about uh, the progress on this new uh, remote monitoring technology. Jenny Clawson is a soil scientist and will talk us through the importance of increasing soil carbon in our soils and how it relates to general overall soil health. Um, thank you Jenny for um, joining us today and uh, she'll also be discussing some specific activities that can be implemented to increase soil carbon on farm. Over to you Jenny. Great, thank you Hannah, thank you to the Future Food Network uh, for the opportunity to present and thank you all for attending. So for my talk today I just wanted to go over some foundational concepts um, for how to consider soil carbon in your soil and management system. But firstly, that's good to get started. Um, just a definition, we've been talking a little bit about soil health today. Um, but I just wanted to define or put soil health in a framework. And this particular definition has four aspects um, that I like because it considers the function and management and how we can consider soil. So the first component um, that defines soil health is the ability of the soil to sustain the productivity, diversity and environmental services of a terrestrial ecosystem. But importantly, and particularly in our management systems, we can maintain, promote or recover 
um, the condition of that soil through implementation of sustainable soil management practices. And just as important as it is to maintain or promote and build our soil health, it's just as important to ensure that we aren't degrading um, or have any losses in that soil system and the, the soil services that it provides. And just with human health, uh, there is no single measure that can capture all aspects of soil health. But I'll go into these just a little bit um, in that conceptually we can frame soil into having typical properties that you might consider. And so the physical soil texture, gravel content, the water holding capacity, the capacity of the soil to, um, for water infiltration, the chemicals, so what's the pH of the soil, nutrient availability, cation exchange capacity, and then the biological, are there any diseases, what's the microbial biomass, um, the ability for nutrient cycling. And really for me, the, the little bit in the middle where they interact and all work well together and have optimum soil function um, could be a concept of soil health, but really they don't just stay static either. They're continuously interacting with one another, changing one aspect will influence another. Um, and of course there's constant and a tight coupling relationship with environment, topography, landscape, um, and the management systems that we have. So it's probably just to keep in mind, today I'll be speaking more just around the carbon component and then, but as Wesley um, indicated, carbon is just one aspect of the soil. And so even if we're focusing on that um, for today's session, changing that or changing some of the other things are gonna have ongoing influences to the rest of the soil and how that soil may function. For the next few slides, I'm just gonna go through a snapshot of soil organic carbon. Um, and it's probably just foundational conversions if if any of this is new. So soil car carbon is just one component of soil organic matter. And we assume that about 58% of soil organic matter is carbon. So if you have your soil carbon tests, you can use a conversion of 1.72 to understand what your soil organic matter is. Aside from just the carbon, soil organic matter also has hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, and other elements. And this is particularly important understanding some of the other benefits that a soil organic matter can provide um, for our product, production. That in every tonne of the stable form of carbon in the soil, it contains about 85 kilos of nitrogen, 20 kilos of phosphorus and 15 kilos of sulfur. So just with an average um, turnover rate, this can provide um, a fair bit of um, mineralization of those elements for the crop in season. But equally as important as what the soil can provide for you as a bank, we also need to pay that back. So pay that back with the fertilizers that we put through growing legumes through the crops. Otherwise, if we're mining this down, this is can't provide as much to the ongoing crop and um, the overall function starts to decrease. And the next little bit is just some maths going through some other conversions. So the standard measurement that we get back from the lab that you might be more familiar with is organic carbon as a percentage. For carbon stocks, however, so for carbon accounting, um, this needs a conversion and additional measurements, and they are the bulk density, which is the volume of soil in a given volume, gravel content and depth. So we use this to be able to convert organic carbon as a percentage into tons of carbon per hectare. So in this example that I've used, a 3.3% carbon in a bulk density of 1.3 in 10 centimetres of soil, that equates to 42.9 tons of carbon per hectare. Now, when we're talking about carbon accounting, however, we're talking about carbon dioxide equivalents. So one ton of carbon per hectare is equal to 3.67 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent and one carbon dioxide equivalent, that's one ACU. Um, and that's just to do the back calculation, that's 0.27 tons of carbon per hectare. So when you're thinking about increasing your carbon levels, sometimes they might, depending on the work that you're looking at or the terminology that's used, it's just helpful to contextualize or be able to frame it in a way that makes sense for your soil and likely um, what might be possible with production gains. And with that, um, Wesley had on his figure just some instances of reviews of differences in land use change and those changes in carbon. Just in general, unless it's a drastic change, the rough rule of thumb is you can work toward about a zero to 0.3 tonnes of carbon 
um, benefit per hectare per year. And when we're trying to think of that into what the background stock might be, so in my example of a 3.3 carbon um, in the topsoil, that's less than a 1% increase for the total, total carbon stock or just a 0 0.02 increase in soil carbon. So it's just mindful to be aware of the changes that we're wanting to see, that it is a slow scale, it takes time, and then there's a lot of spatial and temporal variability with that. So with, with that, you work through your carbon um, service provider with this, but we need enough time and samples to make sure we're confidently able to measure that change. This is just a quick, um, this is just an example of the variability that can happen spatially. It's um, some data that comes out of New South Wales and it's a 40 by 40 meter grid. And they've measured 20 samples within this at five centimeter to the five centimeters. And the whole average is just above two, but the range um, ranges from 1.4 to 2.75. So if you're trying to detect a 0.02% change, you're just not able to do that with inherent variability in this location. But over time, if you're able to build that and through the sampling design, you might be able to. And then this one's just showing the temporal variability. Um, uh, this work is from the US and they just measured the same study area over time. And although the trend line is an increase, we have the seasonal variability in natural fluxes. So this does smooth out again over time. But it's just important to be mindful that in this particular example, um, depending on when they happen to sample, the range for reporting could be anywhere from one to four tonnes of carbon accumulated per hectare per year. So the source of the carbon in the soil is just a function of the net primary um, productivity minus any losses. Because of this, soil is considered both a source and a sink for carbon. Um, and then within that, um, there are losses through just the natural decomposition, ongoing nutrient cycling, and perhaps any losses of um, through erosion. The fate of carbon in the soil um, just broadly has three functional pools, and each of these have different um, permanence and different ratios within the soil, and they also have different functions within the soil. So although with carbon sequestration, uh, we want to have the, maybe want to have the concept of trying to have the carbon there and store it there for as long as possible, but in terms of soil function and soil use, the ideal situation is somehow to increase our plant or primary um, plant and animal residues in a way that we can increase our carbon, but also use it at the same time. So increase the carbon, which will come with increased losses because those losses are associated with nutrient cycling um, and turnover, which provides a lot of benefit for soil function. I'll just go through some examples on how changes in management can influence each of these functions. So this is um, a 70 year modelled uh, bit of work based in South Australia. And here they have over time, 20 or 35 years of a wheat fallow rotation and then um, converted to permanent pasture. So when you just measure the total carbon alone at Year 15 and 43, they have the same total carbon amount, which is fine and it can be informative. But when you look at the different fractions of the soil, it's the inert and the resistant fraction that's relatively um, not responsive to management changes, especially at this time scale. Um, whereas the humus and the particulate, they're a lot more responsive. So here where we have the first wheat fallow um, use. We're in this situation, we're mining down the bank of soil carbon. We're not producing enough crop to be able to replenish that and we're using the um, nutrients that comes with that. It's the particulate that's been very quickly mined down by the microbes. And then over time, the humate, because this is depleted, um, is starting to get mined down as well. Then with the change to permanent pasture, it's also the particulate fraction, the labile fraction, that's quite, that responds more quickly. Um, and then over time, the humus will build, but just note that it's not building at the same rate as what it is in the decline. So it takes time. And then looking at these two time points, the relative ratio of the particulate versus the inert is quite different too. So what that infers is just a different um, function and a different fertility of the soil. So although we can measure carbon, sometimes 
it's not just the carb and it's it's the other parts of the soil and how it's all working together. Um, so just at any time in your soil, what um, could we be thinking of in terms of what's attainable with the soil organic matter that we might be trying to achieve? There's a theoretical potential and that's limited by clay content. So the more clay, the more um, carbon it can accumulate depth and um, topography will have influence what is attainable and that might be governed by environment and time so um, uh, yeah, rainfall and temperature and then what's the actual and so this is the level of carbon that we have in the soil at the moment and that's governed by what has effectively been the management processes up until that point but depending on where you are if you're wanting to here be here and maintain um, the levels of where you are the process would be preserve the resource, um, keep the net primary productivity as the same or somehow increase that um, and avoid any erosion. But then to build or to try and seek and a more attainable to the attainable limit, um, optimizing management to somehow get closer to this rain limited environment, um, theoretical threshold, that's effectively just increasing the biomass, increasing the net primary productivity and decreasing losses. And then you can also go beyond that by adding external carbon sources. But just to be mindful that this, in terms of um, carbon sequestration perspective, that's just transferring carbon from one spot to another. Um, and I'll go through the next slides in the necess necessity of once we've changed something that we need to maintain it. And of course, with any change to the system, it all needs to be a profitable um, exercise. So this next few slides is going through the concept of equi the equilibrium in the soil, essentially. Um, and at any point, so we could be at any stage. So the equilibrium is effectively just the balance of the inputs minus the exports, the losses, but also what's happened before then. So in this scenario, say from time zero, the upper equilibrium might be able to be leached, um, reached by, say, converting to trees and leaving them in um, there for 100 years at a time. The low, lower equili equilibrium, that could perhaps be um, it's been converted and it's been mined down, it hasn't had any nutrition or any management and um, the soil carbon has been depleted. But then maybe our management system in here is somewhere in between in the middle, it's not quite up at the upper equilibrium, but we haven't completely depleted our carbon resources. Now, in the previous example where I spoke briefly around um, increasing the organic amendments, we could do that and try and bring it up closer to here. But as soon as we stop, what will happen is because we haven't got the ongoing um, inputs of the carbon, eventually that will start to decrease as well. So whatever you're thinking about, if you're trying to wanting to increase the carbon, that system, that new system needs to essentially create its own new equilibrium. And this is just a real life example of is effectively that scenario. It's a long term um, trial site at Rothamsted in um, the UK. And so here we've got the control, the untreated control and a treatment with the addition of um, fertilizers. And they in themselves you would consider are fairly stable over this time period. It's effectively at equilibrium. In this picture treatment, they've added a nutrient rich farmyard manure and that's increased the carbon quite a lot. And perhaps that if that was maintained, that equilibrium might keep going and then flatten out somewhere around here. In 1871, so that's a hundred years, over hundred years since this last measurement, um, they stopped the farmyard manure treatment. But what's interesting about in this soil is that it didn't decrease automatically all the way back down here. It's a slower decline back down. So this is indicating that is building up some of that, it has built up some of that resistant fraction in the soil and could be associated with a higher clay content that's been able to protect that in the soil. Just another note here is the curve to which it changes is that at any point the change in carbon isn't linear and so depending on where you are and your journey in increasing your soil organic carbon the rate of change may not always be the same depending on your starting point. So I'll just go through now um, just some what are the key drivers of um, fitting in your system to what might be 
a potential for increasing carbon in your soil. So this is um, a WA study that included over a thousand sample points. And here I've just shown the two big main effects, which is the annual um, rainfall and annual temperature. And the main things I just want you to take around is um, the spread in the data and where that happens. And just to indicate that that spread probably indicates more opportunity. So if you're in this range, you might have more opportunity for carbon sequestration. And then in annual temperatures in the cooler environments, there's more spread, so perhaps more opportunity depending on where you are in that spectrum. Not to say that there's no opportunity here, it's just that the range isn't as big as these um, wetter and cooler environments. And effectively, that's just driven by net primary productivity, um, as well as a slower decomposition rate in the cooler environments. So from this data, are the drivers that influence um, carbon, higher carbon levels, this pH, clay, um, the pasture systems have more than the cropping. And in the high rainfall areas, um, fertility started to come out as um, in showing situations of having more carbon at some levels. Just to go through the pH a little bit, um, this pH is a really important factor in soil that intuitively or hopefully <laughs> would think that having increasing um, pH will increase our carbon levels. But what they found in this data, and this is a, just a graphic uh, line that the whole data behind it isn't as clean as this, but what they found was at around 4.7, there's a clear break in the carbon accumulation, carbon content in the soil. So at low pHs, carbon's actually accumulating. And then further research into this was looking into the microbial biomass of this, and microbial biomass at these levels is just is decreasing as well. And so then using an avert, um, conversion of looking at microbial use efficiency, which microbial use efficiency is the ability of microbes to grow but, um, and as a ratio with their um, res respiration, so it's their efficiency for, for carbon, um, at this acidic levels, it's actually declining. So the reason why carbon here isn't decreasing is because the microbes aren't functioning, that they're not turning over the carbon and that's um, in terms of soil health, that's not a functioning soil. But I also just want to point out that if you happen to be here and you decide to start a carbon project as an example that's probably not a sustainable place to be that really we do need especially our topsoils around here for this optimum functioning nutrient turnover and for um, rhizobia and not having toxic aluminium for our plants as well as the fertility and then the subsoil is a little bit deeper Just another study um, just for some of the big drivers that uh, for carbon. So this is um, a study in the Albany sand plain where they measured uh, a whole sequence of crops, um, paddocks with a range of continuous cropping, um, mixed cropping, annual pasture, perennial pasture, over a gradient of rainfall. And they measured um, the top meter. So what they found um, was that in these soils, 85% of the carbon is in the top 30 centimetres and two-thirds of the total carbon is actually in the 0 to 10. Um, carbon levels were significant for rainfall, land use and depth. So that means um, depth had a difference, the overall land use had a difference and rainfall had a gradient. So again, linking back to net primary productivity. Um, but then with the depths, they found compared so then with the depths, they modelled the theoretical potential or attainable um, for each of the depths of the different cropping systems. And so the black box is what was measured. And then the white is what um, is theoretically possible with um, through modelling. So here you're just showing the difference between the permanent pasture and continuous crop that the permanent pasture had more carbon um, as a, as of its potential than the continuous crop, um, but both have opportunities for increasing carbon at depth. But in general, 
in some situations we may have opportunity for increasing for the zero to 10, but in particular, um, it's at depth where we have more opportunity to gain. And this is just another example of um, another case study, but this one's in New South Wales where they measured um, different pasture systems to try and determine the influence of perennial pastures versus annual pastures um, versus grazing systems. But they were unable to determine a difference um, between some of those factors. But what did come out was an increase in carbon where pastures had been improved. And so, and this was linked to a increase in again net primary productivity but this improvement in this particular system was through increasing phosphorus but what they found was it wasn't consistent across all sites that some sites had an increase of carbon at depth by having this increase in management um, but whereas some soils only had an increase in the zero to ten centimeters so i just wanted to sort of summarize some of that into this framework somewhat of the scale to which you can think about where your farm or situation might fit into some of the big processes that um, can govern carbon accumulation. So some of the key concepts in some of these studies is because the processes that drive carbon accumulation are large, like um, the climate, temperature, rainfall, uh, clay content, and some of the big um, factors that depending on the study, it can be hard to measure, it can be difficult to measure some of those smaller management differences. So those management differences across a larger area need to be big enough in order to be able to be picked up as a as an influence in some of these changes. So thinking of the farm versus paddock scale, it's important to contextualize the large drivers. So for example, where do you sit in um, the temperature gradient or the rainfall gradient or um, the soil type factor or within your farm, what's the topography and my different um, clay contents to then probably work out from there what is the opportunity, in which case it's more localised, then it's more localised knowledge that can show changes in manage, um, changes in carbon accumulation through the differences like management intensity. And so just the general management mechanisms um, conceptually just can go through just a few different ways. So prevention is important. So with how slow it takes to build carbon, um, preserving what we have is just critically important, particularly if environments become warmer and drier, it's gonna be harder to accumulate um, over, the next many, over the next years. So here we have just protect the topsoil, minimize erosion, stubble management, sustainable grazing, and minimize tillage. And then through to maintain, maintain or if we can build our carbon, and having um, any management practice that effectively can increase the amount of plant material, the net primary productivity in a given soil type or land use area. And just to put these in categories, so these are the approved land um, practices of that are currently there for the soil organic carbon projects in the ERF. And just in the broad categories, um, they're managing inputs to increase your productivity. So soil amelioration to remove your constraints or constraints to the landscape. Um, crop and pasture management, so maybe more legumes, increasing, uh, having more ground cover. Improved your grazing management, so um, changing the stocking rate. Um, and minimising losses. And then here with the minimising losses, I put this in this category because they're, they're saying that what they're, they're a placement management for something that wasn't done. So the relative change that this could have will depend on the severity or what was happening before. So if you're tilling every single year or burning your stubble every single year, by not doing that anymore, that might be the relative gain. But because of these importance of the localised differences and what is possible at the local level. It's just important to get the local advice to contextualise these with beyond the large climate um, soil type pH drivers of carbon. And just to summarise um, that the focus on function for your system for soil health and that the biological, physical and chemical interact continuously. 
Um, biology is compute affected by the most limiting factor, um, but irrespective of whether you're wanting to enter a carbon project or just improve your carbon or soil organic matter, small steps for toward, toward maintaining and growing provide long-term resilience to the system. And if you're trying to build your carbon and particularly for a carbon project and identifying what that new equilibrium is, it does really does require a long-term approach and ability to be able to ma maintain or exceed that. Um, and then likewise, just with the fertility management, just having maybe thinking about carbon or organic matter in terms of your fertility budget and ensuring that you're overall having a balance to your carbon and your inputs um, for that for the soil organic matter. And so models can be useful in combination in understanding what's potential for your soil carbon um, and with, with in combination with local advice and assessment of the current status and your future goals. I'll just leave this up while I'm here. Um, and I've got a QR code on the screen. So if you have an iPhone or an iPad, these free eBooks uh, have been written for WA Context and they cover a lot of some of the information that I covered, but a lot more. Every time I open one, they contained, contain more information that I can find useful. The QR code I have there is for the soil organic matter one, so it's pretty relevant for today. But um, And then there's three more that are coming out, so I highly recommend those. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and for suggesting those soil um, soil books, I've had a look through them and they are great, really, really good information in those. So we'll make sure that QR code is sent out to our registrations as well. Um, your information um, has really um, given us a great overview of how that physical, chemical and biological um, parts of the soil need to work together. And it's not all just about carbon. Um, there's a lot more in soils that uh, will help us uh, get the best productivity out of our farms. Um, and I loved your um, message about this is a journey. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. So we have to be patient and um, it will take time to see those changes. But it's really important to start as soon as you're ready and, um, and get those changes on farm. Uh, happening now. So we've got a couple of questions. Um, one from Mel Holland. Uh, is the fluctuation of carbon levels in soil dependent on season? I.e. are you better to test in saturated soils or dry seasons? Good question. It'll go down in dry seasons. Um, and someone who's more familiar with the carbon projects might be able to comment on it because there is flexibility around their requirement in the timeline for some of those measurements to counteract if you happen to be in drought for a little while and, and the um, carbon goes down. So after a high production year, as an example, it, it goes right up. Okay, I think Carla just turned her mute off. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I just, I, I'm not a, um, wanting to, to give an ex, expert view on that, um, but um, just that as far as I'm aware, the best time of year to do your soil sampling, to, to do your actual soil sampling is, is when it's dry and just in terms of the actual time of year to do, to do that, um, to take your measurements. But um, I think that's why with, um, the clean re regulator project, you have that, you've probably got that three to five year window. So if you actually had a bad year, you might want to actually wait one more year. And if that's a better year, you'd probably do it in year four, for example. Um, but then there's obviously risk in managing that in, in case you got another bad year. But um, yeah, so um, that, that's why there's that, there is that little bit of a window, but it's, it's, it has to be um, measured and reported, I think, um, a maximum of five. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for jumping in on that one, Carla. Um, I'm not sure what slide um, this question is referring to. This is from Tony. Jenny, why have you used millimetres and micrometres? This is confusing. Oh, that might be in my reference to the fractions. Yes, apologies. I um, 
in early on when I was going through these, I had a mental note to change those over to the same unit. So sorry about that. I can um, so just the so um, the fresh label 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 area. It's about half a mil to two mil, and then anything under that, it's, it's more associated with the mineral, and that's um, under half a mil, so fifty micron. And then the resistant can be anything under two mil because that's um, some can be related to charcoal and that can be throughout the fractions. All right, wonderful. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we have another question. Um, it is a broader question and I'm going to leave it till the end of the workshop because I think it's going to touch on a, a few of our speakers and a few of our experts. So um, I'll leave that one for now. But thank you again, Jenny. That was wonderful to get that overview. And uh, we all just have to be patient and uh, get those projects in now to see the productivity um, and eventually see those changes in carbon. Um, all right, our last speaker today is Dan Hester, uh, who is running a project comparing the soil carbon sequestration rates when using biomineral fertilisers and comparing them to conventional synthetic fertilizers. He is going to give us a quick run through about the project, what it involves, and also take us on a virtual field walk through the main trial site and two of the demonstration sites. Thanks, Dan, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Hannah. Thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks to all the previous speakers. Um, it's been very, very interesting so far. I'll just uh, bring up my first part of my presentation. Okay, so today I'm presenting on a project that's just started. It's a three-year project that's between uh, my company, Podega Investments, and the MLA. Uh, the project is looking at utilising biomineral fertilisers to reduce, so utilising biomineral fertilisers in comparison to current synthetic fertilisers with the aim of reducing carbon emissions uh, through a couple of methods, which I'll go into later on. And also, the, probably the key item of it is to maintain production. So I guess the sort of the background to the project, I guess my, my background, I've got a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. I currently operate a small cattle operation on the family farm in Bridgetown in WA, which is the location of the, the main trial site. Uh, I've been involved in well, agriculture my whole life and in research on and off over the last 20 years. So the, the, the project originated from well, probably the, the real driver was the drought year for, our, for Bridgetown, for our farm, uh, between 2017 and to 2019, which really lowered the carrying capacity of our farm over those three years, three years of, of drought. Uh, where our rainfall sort of, uh, in 2019 was the lowest on record, it halved. We were finding the, the, the rainfall patterns were getting later starting, uh, earlier finishing, so the season was getting shorter, and we were getting longer periods of no rainfall uh, through the winter and spring. So that, that's obviously driven a concern around climate change. Um, I'm very interested, we're interested in ways of increasing the, our soil's water holding capacity uh, and how that'll improve production in, in the drier years. With the theory that if we can hold more water in the soil, pasture will grow much better and longer if those drying periods continue to occur. And how we came on to biomineral fertilizers is we've just been monitoring colleagues' work with these fertilisers in uh, in Carnarvon and also in New Norcia in, in Western Australia. So what's the objective of the project? The objective is to determine the ability of biomineral fertilisers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from a cattle production uh, operation. And it's doing this through soil, through long-term soil carbon sequestration and increasing the anti-methanogenic properties of pasture. And the key secondary outcome we're looking for and we're going to measure is without impacting the profitability or the production of the farming operation. Um, I guess as, as a producer ourselves, we want to 
continue to maintain our profitability and, and, and production. Uh, the estimation for the potential mitigation, now this is um, from, so we're working uh, with UWA, with the soil, with the ag science and soil science departments. Their forecasting, we can, uh, over the three years of the project, increase an additional five to 10 tonnes of carbon stored in the soil, in the biomineral treatment over the conventional synthetic fertiliser treatment within the three years. Plus, we'll hopefully get a reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions through weight gain efficiency. So the product we're using is a called Traforte Cropping Plus, and this is able to achieve uh, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions through two mechanisms. The first one is by increasing the formation of the permanent humus compounds through an increase of organic matter stability. Uh, and the, this is the contribution of the organic matter fractions that are more resistant to de decomposition. And it's obviously and crucial for the increasing soil carbon sequestration. This is done by using by the microbes in the biomineral fertilizer, uh, colonizing the roots of the plants and draining more carbon into the rhizosphere of the soil by increasing, to increase the soil carbon pool. And the, bio, the second, and the other way is the biomineral fertilizer will increase root biomass, which is the source of the locking up carbon in the soil over time. The second mechanism for the, for the uh, biomineral fertilizer product is to improve soil bio, biology, fertility, plant nutrition, and reduces carbon emissions by increasing the antimethanogenic properties of pasture through increased nutrient density and that'll increase the weight gain efficiency, which basically means that the um, animal eats less grass over its life, over the life of its of the animal, and therefore it releases less, less greenhouse gas emissions or methane. So what are biomineral and synthetic fertilizers? A biomineral or the biomineral fertilizer product we're using in this trial, the Traforte. It's a mineral-based fertilizer, which consists of a large range of fine mineral ores, such as micas, um, alkali, feldspars, rock phosphate, crystalline silicas that are blended with various sulfates. Uh, and this combination is then blended with a suite of microbes, fun fungi and bacteria, and includes a phosphate solubil solubilizing bacteria, mycorrhizal or fungi covered in a um, macro coat polymer. The polymer is then like that's coated around the mineral fertilizer and then that uh, creates a, a slow release fertilizer, slow release nutrient pattern. I guess one of the key reasons, <coughs> sorry, I wanted to, we wanted to use a biomineral fertilizer is that it, with um, the, I think the percent is, is a, a, like a, a 10, 7 and 5. Um, nitrogen phosphorus potassium uh, it, we are putting out the we're putting out quite a large amount of uh, nutrients similar to a synthetic fertilizer but in a natural state so synthetic fertilizer they're chemically manufactured materials containing the primary nutrients necessary for plant growth but obviously nitrogen phosphorus potassium <laughs> they're man-made uh, different uh, an inorganic fertilizer, normally derived from the petroleum industry. And interestingly, the, the plant cannot distinguish between organic or inorganic synthetic fertilizers. It's, um, it'll take the, I suppose, the path of least resistance to create, to acquire the easiest nutrient. The project overview, project um, is comprised of three trials and demonstrations. So the main trial site or the main project is uh, made up of two treatments, best practice synthetic fertilizer versus the best practice biomineral fertilizer. I think it's, it was very important when we set up this to, to really compare what is the best practice synthetic versus best practice <coughs> biomineral. Because so I've sort of, I found in my, I suppose in, the re, in researching a lot of these biomineral fertilizers or alternative fertilizer types. Some of the data 
never really looked at best practice versus best practice. It would obviously they'd be heavily focused on favoring one of the type of fertilizers. <coughs> Sorry. Measurements we'll be doing uh, we'll be within this project one is uh, soil testing for carbon and soil health. <coughs> testing for pasture production, pasture nutritional quality, uh, and in vitro testing of the pasture and the monitoring yielding calf for weight gain uh, over the summer. So the, pro the main trial site, which is, um, it's, an irrig it's uh, irrigated under service irrigation. It's been a lot being like that for the past 40 years. Uh, it's trichuria based in the summer and ryegrass and clover based in the winter. Uh, so the car, the so we the program we run is calving down in May in April May, wean in November. The calves then go on to the irrigated kaikuya in December, and we will we'll measure their weight gain from December through to um, March April May. The paddock is thirty hectares. It'll be divided into six paddocks. So there'll be two treatments, two treatments by three replicates of about five hectares each. So there'll be three, three replicates of the biomineral fertilizer and three replicates of the synthetic fertilizer. Uh, the second project within the, the larger project is a small plot trial. This will be contained within the irrigated area. And this, which the aim of this small plot trial is to uh, get adjust for the um, best practice versus best practice, and so we'll be in this one. We'll be applying the equivalent nutrient quantities of synthetic and biomineral fertilizers. So they'll, they'll get the same amount or same number of units of P, same number of units of N, same number of sulfur and potassium. And within this, we'll make. The measurements are slightly less. We're measuring the impact on carbon and soil health and also the and pasture production. And then the third project is the uh, what are called producer demonstration sites. So there's three sites across the southwest, and these are all being done under dry land conditions. They're, they're all long term on long term synthetic. Uh, uh, synthetic fertilizer farms that are cattle producers. And there's probably, there's probably two, the two reasons for doing it. One is to uh, extend, the, extend the project with what we're doing. So I'll, I'll show you a map in a few slides time where they are. And then it's to, I suppose, adjust or account for the, what it's like under dry land conditions because not everyone has the luxury of uh, irrigation. So the key outcomes of the project, I guess do, doing by biomineral fertilizers have the ability to increase soil carbon, soil microbial biomass, and in turn reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I guess there's certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence out there that it does. As a, as a farmer, for me to change, I'd like to see the evidence uh, on, on my farm, hence why I, we're, we're running this project. Why have we chose an irrigated site? Uh, the aim is that this will allow us to speed up the process. As has been mentioned in previous, uh, you know, the previous talkers, soil carbon, anything to do with soil carbon is, is a long-term process. So we're hoping that we're using um, an irrigated site. We're growing, you know, we're growing grass 12 months of the year. The microbes will have, the, will have access to living plants and roots and moisture for 12 months of the year for the three years instead of the typical five to six months uh, of, of, I suppose, green plant material that you get in the dry land conditions. Second outcome, and, and very, definitely equally as important, can production be maintained by, if you change from a synthetic fertiliser to a biomineral fertiliser? Extending this to farmers, that's going to be one of the key questions and key answers we need to have. Uh, can we increase nutrient density in the pasture to reduce total greenhouse gas emissions over the life of, a, of producing a calf? 
And thirdly, which we're not actually going to measure, but we'll, we'll certainly be watching, uh, will increasing soil carbon increase the water holding capacity of the soil? Is it something we're going to be able to notice? And will it re reduce the impact of the hotter, drier periods through winter that are becoming more common? So if you see the map, this is, a, for those who don't know WA, it's probably going to be a little bit confusing, but um, Perth is uh, from Benja, which you can see is about 150 kilometres straight north. So you can see we've got quite a large geographical spread of the demonstration sites. Uh, Bridgetown is where we are from, it has an annual rainfall of 820 plus millimetres. Uh, Benja is 950 and Witchcliffe has an annual rainfall of 1123 millimetres. So I'll now just change over to the virtual field walk. So I hope Hello, how are we all? Uh, so this is the site for the um, biomineral fertiliser demonstration. This is site one. No, no, this is, but this is a it's an annual pasture site that um, it's been pastured for the last twenty or thirty years, predominantly made up of ryegrass, clover, and cakeweed, and with a smattering of cotton through it, which gives us a bit of summer feed. Uh, we, we carve down our heifers. Heifers here. We in the background, they're a uh, Angus Charolais cross, with the majority Angus. Um, if we pan down to the soil side, you can see the soil, it's mainly uh, sandy with a little bit of gravel, and it's a, um, it's a duplex, it's a duplex soil, so the sand will be oh, roughly 30 to 40 centimetres deep, and then we'll go down into gravel. Uh, it's quite uniform across the site, the site's about... Uh, 50 years in size. This will be split in half. The biomineral fertilizer will go on the far side near the bush. The synthetic fertilizers will come over on this side. The, the, the long term fertilizer history is 120 kilos of super potash three in one and followed up with a nitrogen granular top up at the start of spring, some, sometimes between the end of August and early September. So this side will continue, we'll spread the super potash in May at the uh, Trefort uh, cropping um, product, the biomineral fertiliser out in, in May as well on the other side. And then we'll come back here in late August, spreading a NK, like a nitrogen potassium sulfur type product. And we'll use their sulfur sink nitrogen product uh, over there. Then uh, in May, we'll, then I'm gonna, this will be soil tested in about the next two or three weeks. There'll be, there'll be three 20, three 20 metre by 20 metre uh, plots uh, set up and we'll soil test them at zero, uh, from zero to 50 centimetres. There'll be six in total, three in each, uh, three in each treatment. And they'll be retested again in 24 and retested in 25 test the soil health, carbon, microbial activity. And then they'll have pasture cages through here all winter. Uh, and we will measure the pasture growth each winter to see if we, we can see a um, difference in production and, and in term carrying capacity. And that'll also be the samples will be sent away to UWA to go in vitro testing to look at um, pasture density and the amount of uh, carbon emissions from each, that each uh, cow is producing. Okay. Uh, okay, this is the uh, down now, now down at the main trial site. So this is the, the irrigated uh, area. Um, so you can see in the background, there's the, the, the bank. So this is a surface irrigation site. Uh, it's about 30 hectares, the paddock in total, probably 17 or 18 hectares under irrigation. Um, it's predominantly kaikuya based in the summer, ryegrass, clover, uh, in winter, the traditional pasture. And, um, you know, this, and over winter, we graze sheep and, and cows with calves and, and lambs. And then come into the end of spring, summer, 
we bring down, as we wean the calves, wean the lambs, they come down here to be finished off their mums before they go off to the farm for either a feedlot. Cattle go to a feedlot, the target, target weight is sort of 350, 360 kilos, and the lambs go to an abattoir they get, after they're finished. Um, so what will happen, this paddock will be split into six uh, smaller paddocks or six replicates. There'll be um, two permanent fences and and one long um, hot wire that will only be put up in the summer for the trial. Uh, your typical fertiliser regime here is 120 kilos of super potash in May, uh, then another 120 kilos of a granular nitrogen potassium sulfur type product in the end of spring, the start of spring, sorry. We'll then try and give it an, another big dose with the last rain in spring of another 100, 120 kilos. There's plenty of nitrogen or fertility in the soil as we go into the summer and start to irrigate. And then we'll try, and then we do, and we'll put another one out, which we put another 100 kilos of urea out about a month ago, just ahead of an irrigation and, uh, and, and watch it in. Um, so yeah, the cat, this will carry, uh, say 150 calves over the summer, 150, 300 kilo calves. Uh, nor up till now it has just been grazed as one large paddock but we're now splitting it so we'll start to rotationally graze it which i think will increase its carrying capacity as well so one of the so on the trial as i think we're, we're measuring soil carbon soil fertility predominantly soil carbon and soil microbial activity soil health we're measuring pasture production and uh, cattle growth rates so you can see here with which this is our prototype um, pasture cage, which was put in about three and a half weeks ago. You can see it's, it's working well. The cattle haven't, there's cattle down in here at the moment. The cattle haven't worried it. And uh, it's, it will make uh, measuring nice and easy. Uh, and you can see the good uh, Kaikuya clover base, clover base in the, um, in the pasture stand sward. Um, so soil type, we are, uh, so it's a duplex, predominantly sand over clay. So there's, we irrigate two ways. Uh, with the surface, it just comes through pipes and comes across the top. And then also the, uh, the, the channels have been cut down to just to the clay level. So the water seeps through the bank and runs down underneath the uh, ground on top of the clay where the kaikuri roots can get the moisture. So it's like both ways wet the soil up quickly. We can now irrigate the whole area in about a, in about a week, and we will irrigate probably three times over the summer. So, and then the rest of the time, the, um, we get nice, good growth of uh, green pasture. So we've got just got a little hole dug over here to show you the soil part, give you an idea of the roots yet. So you can see here, we've got, this is the, obviously the top soil. Um, you can see the quite a high organic carbon and uh, organic matter content. This is all the kaikuri roots. It then comes down to here as we start to move into the clay. So this is where we target to run the soil or the water above the clay here. But even it's not permeable, the roots are getting down into it nicely. And you can't see, there's a little bit of gravel content to it. And, uh, that's, I hope that's given you all a good background of what, uh, what the trial is going to achieve. Okay, so this is the uh, producer demonstra demonstration site number two. Uh, we're at Benja on the, um, in the Peel region, Western Australia. Uh, so as you can see, this, is, this will be site number two. We've got some low-lying uh, low flats at the Peel, which the main soil type here is a sandy loam, sandy gravelly loam. So as we go up the hill, we get into a beautiful red loam uh, very, very productive up there. Uh, traditionally, this country will get 25 units of phosphorus uh, at the start of winter, which want to go down April, topped up with a bit of nitrogen late, uh, late spring, maybe when paddock can be get on, but on. A lot of country goes a little, gets a little bit wet during winter, coming with such high rainfall, which the high country doesn't. Uh, so for this for the demonstration, this site will be splitting into two, 
half of the site will be on the flats, two thirds of the flight the site will be in the flats, one third up on the hill. Like this side, this, this western side will be cleaned with biomineral fertilizer, and the far side on the eastern side will have the uh, synthetic fertilizers. Okay, uh, so I'll just continue on. Just got a few more slides to get through. Um, so the soil testing, you know, hopefully that gives you a good background of the of the different sites and, and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, the soil testing will involve soil inorganic carbon, organic carbon, total carbon and total N, uh, the all nutrients plus trace elements and plus the soil health, so the soil microbial biomass, which is all being conducted by uh, UWA. Right. Uh, so I think I mean, I've covered a lot of this already in the in the field walk at uh, the site one of the demonstration uh, sites is um, it's a long term super and granular nitrogen, fourteen to sixteen units of P, fifty to sixty units of nitrogen plus sulfur, potassium, and trace elements is required. Main trial site will be uh, best practice applications for each fertilizer. Uh, and the small plot will be uh, matching the nutrient amounts. Um, so I'll keep going. And this is the sort of aerial overview of the um, of the irrigation site. You can see where the two dams are on the bottom right and the mid top. This is taken at the end of summer from Google Earth, so it's and it's probably five or six years old. The the pink fences are the new permanent fences that are going to be put in. And the orange fence will be the um, semi-permanent uh, hot wire that will be put in for summer to allow the rotational grazing. And then we'll just spread the fertilizers as, as per the, the different paddocks, the different treatments. Um, so the site two, Benja, sandy gravel and a red loam. It's a long-term super potash and granular nitrogen. Um, and I think what I hadn't mentioned, it sort of normally gets 50 to 60 units of N in that sort of early to late spring where they can get on there to try and get the good, that's when you do the majority of your growth, uh, past your growth to get through the summer. Uh, Witch Cliff, we, hasn't been mentioned. Uh, that's a grey sandy loam. Fertiliser history, very similar to the other two sites, super potash and a granular nitrogen putting out 12 to 15 units of phosphorus late autumn, 30 to 40 units in early spring. Um, and again, sulfur, potassium and trace elements is required. Timeline of the project. The project's only commenced, it's only about well, six weeks old, commenced in February 22. Um, yeah, the soil testing will be conducted. The, the baselines are being done now. Intermediate soil testings, just to give us an idea of how the project is going in March 24, and the final soil testing will be conducted in March or April 25. Um, yielding calf production will be measured each summer with calves um, on the irrigation, and this pasture production recorded on the demonstration sites over winter. Um, I'd just like to thank the partners in the project, Meat and Livestock Australia, who are the co-contributors, Future Food Network, Hannah and the team have been excellent. They're conducting all the extension work for the project. Uh, UWA, the Soil Science and Ag Science Department, completing all the soil testing and pasture testing. And Amy Downs Grazing Company are conducting all the on-farm trial work. Hannah. Wonderful, thank you, Dan. Um, that was a great overview of the project. Um, another one that will take a, a long time to see the, the final results, but hopefully we get um, some good um, data to show farmers what um, might happen with uh, biomineral fertilizers compared to the synthetic ones. Now we have a couple of questions, two questions. Um, Tony has asked, Daniel, what is your view on claying in shallow soils to increase clay content? Poor, oh, I've never heard of that. I know claying certainly works well if you've got a non-wetting issue. Um, 
the, sh the sheer cost of moving enough clay to increase the clay percent enough to have a marked impact on water holding capacity. I'm assuming you're chasing. Um, yeah, I'm not. I've, I've never seen any work on that. I certainly know it works for altering your non for improving non wetting. Um, but yeah, I. I, I haven't heard of to actually trying to directly increase your um, clay content in your soil. Okay. Um, another one from Tony. Um, Daniel, does the soft rock phosphate require an acid soil to release the phosphate similar to rock phosphate? I'm not 100% sure on that. I think he would be on the right path. Um, but then also the microbes that are being um in, let out with the rock phosphate my understanding is that that will um help release the phosphate from the rock phosphate to make a plant available and, and i guess that's the reason i want to do this project you, you do hear these issues with these type of fertilizers so i want to yeah try it and see for myself what the results are great all right. Um, well, there are all the questions for you currently. Um, so thanks again for giving us that overview of the project um, and for putting together the field walk. It was um, great to have that um, refreshing look at on farm and feeling like, well, I tried to feel like I was right there on the farm with you. So thank you again. Um, if you want to follow along with this project, we have a group of observer producers who will be sent updates and information about the workshops. Similar to this one, field days to come together and check in with the results along the way. Um, and any other information about the um, soil carbon project. So if you are interested, uh, send me an email, hannah at futurefoodnetwork.com.au if you're interested in joining this group, we'd love to have you following along. Um, we do have some extra questions for our other um, speakers today. Um, if we all come together um, with videos on and, and um, possibly unmute, so we can have a bit of a conversation about some of these questions. Um, I'll start with Carla. Um, Mel has asked, how do you gauge the ACU costs in this scenario to pay back a project loan in ACU plus projects? Ours has gone from $9 in 2019 to $32 this year. Okay, yeah, and that's, that's an excellent question. Um, I probably um, can answer that in more detail in, in, an, em in an email version afterwards. Um, but um, yeah, it, it actually that has played um, a, um, as a big question for round one projects, um, just because of the variation. And so, um, but it does. Um, I'm not a market predictor, but it, you know there is um, obviously it, the acu price went right up, and then there was um, a policy decision which dropped it right down back to somewhere that it's likely to. Um, to probably a little bit more stable. So um, you, it is, there is um, a slight amount of, of risk in that in the projects where you will actually um, choose choose that price and determine it. And obviously um, there's a bit of a buffer zone with the co-benefits um, because you're, cho you're not choosing the exact market price at that moment for that ACU, but you're basing it on the approximate and, and predicted market price um, combined with um, a bit of a buffer with your co-benefits, and um, and so there is a little a bit of a review about um, options to um, just a little bit of flexibility is being built into the project for round two. Um, so I can answer that in more detail um, after conferring with the rest of with with my colleagues um, because that review is still in place. Okay, great. Thanks, Carla. Um, another one for you though. Uh, will timber products be counted as carbon storage when harvested? Oh, I, I can't, I'm also not um, yet fully conversant with um, the, the plantation um, timber methodology. Um, that, uh, that, I mean, that methodology is, obvious, is obviously based around um, harvested timber. So you've got, a different, you've got different methodologies for permanent plantings 
um, permanent timber and, and farm forestry plantings and, and methodology that, ac that accounts for harvest. So if you're using that, sp that specific um, ERF methodology, then it will take into account that harvest. Okay, great. Um, now, if I go over to Louise, Tony has asked, how do you trade ACUs after they have commenced, i.e. pro rata trade? And will it be like buying bonds? Um, I don't believe it's possible to, to trade a carbon credit unless you have an Australian financial services licence in that category. Um, so a carbon credit is classified as a derivative uh, and it's extremely highly regulated. So unless you have a licence to trade, it would not be possible at the moment. Okay, great. Thanks, Louise. Um, oh, one more for Carla. Um, is it just me or is the system back to front? Uh, how are farmers expected to cover the costs of consultants if they aren't allowed to start their project or even begin baseline testing? If the project isn't viable, you don't know that until you've paid all the cash out to consultants. I guess this is where the funding, the carbon farming. Yeah, it's a good question. And yeah. that, is, that is actually where the carbon farming and land restoration program um, is um, trying to um, make a difference in that regard as to try to help get some of the um, early projects in Western Australia started and um, just provide that buffer for the for the startup costs. Um, it would be um, expected that most most farming enterprises would do a general um, annual soil testing and so they would actually have some idea um, within the, the um, top top 30 centimetres of soil as to um, you know of what where they're starting um, but with regards to the actual investment decision to physically start an activity and and conduct a baseline sample um, yes that is that is after you've registered your project in terms of um, planning and getting advice um, yeah, it's a good point and correct, and that's and that's why the voucher program um, came came into existence as well. There was recognition that um, people needed that extra bit of support to to um, undertake that planning and feasibility. Great, thanks, Carla. Uh, Jenny Adam has asked: um, In a good season or above average rain? Is our soil organic carbon going to be much higher than in a dry year? Yes, um, but I just don't have good data on hand to know how much of that variability changes. But I can try and find some good um, and provide that back to Hannah because I don't I don't have that just off hand, unfortunately. Yep, not a problem. I can send some information out via email f for that question. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, the last question, and it's posed to all of our experts here, um, and it's from Kastutis. Has economic calculations been made for the cost per one hectare if a farmer decides to switch to carbon farming? So this is including carbon credits, monitoring and soil health. That's the first question. Second question, um, is can we compare traditional farming and carbon farming from several years perspective? And thirdly, will carbon farming be a better investment? Is that asked in the, in the context of um, an actual registered um, you know, carbon farming project or um, generally an activity, land management activity that is um, aiming to increase the carbon? I feel like it's a carbon farming project. I believe that Kastutis has actually left um, the Google Meet um, currently, but uh, maybe we can assume that it's the carbon farming project. What was the start, the start of the question? A bit late in the day. Have economic calculations been made for the cost per one hectare? if a farmer decides to switch to carbon farming, including carbon credits, monitoring and soil health? Um, I, I would say that some of the, um, there's, 
there's been a lot of um, data over the years um, in the agency, but uh, I would say that some of the um, round one CFLRP um, future carbon um, projects would start to produce some data in that direction um, in terms of a direct comparison. But yeah, I mean, because there are a lot of variables and it would make a good research project. Um, there are a lot of variables in the sense that you've got these startup costs for your actual ERF carbon project. Um, and the, but then you've also got that the measure for productivity and soil health and other co-benefits that come out of that project. And um, as Louise mentioned, with your natural capital accounting, um, it's it's coming along in leaps and bounds. But um, you know, that's yeah, it's probably in its early stages of having some really good concrete projects. Any Anything to add on that, Louise? Um, yeah, I suppose that's one of the, the key things that we're trying to quantify through our program with all of the monitoring that we do. Um, it is, like you said, Jen, uh, Carla, you know, like there's so many vari variabilities, you know, and I mean, even from the costs of running the project, you know, project developer to, to developer to, you know, they'll, everyone will be different. So it's um, very early. Um, to, to come out with any of that data yet, but I'm sure in the next 10 years we'll have heaps of great data that can tease all that out for us. Yeah. I think maybe a context around that is to break down some of the components where, where the measurement piece um, has, has particular costs attached to it and that's generally cost driven and then and then your value drivers around this, the generation of ACUs and sale of ACUs. And then the, I think what Carla's referring to is the yield and productivity benefits that are tricky to ascertain to just, oh, that increase in carbon on that piece of soil has delivered, you know, $5 a hectare increase of value given the variability of season. But certainly there's work taking place and there's funding going in from federal government and private investment around lowering the measurement cost to target that $3 per hectare. Um, and we're putting some modeling around that with some of the work we're doing to really be able to deliver that on a, um, rather than, you know, sort of separate points throughout the carbon cycle, um, multi, multiple measurements within a year, targeting that $3, uh, $3 per hectare per year but via a combination of technologies. So you, it, it can't be achieved sustainably with any one technology, you need a variety. Uh, that may or may not right at this point stack up to generate an ACU because that has very specific requirements, but through the progression of technology and the uh, you know, uh, certification of some, tech, of some new technologies and increase in the ability to model, that'll start to translate in lower lower costs for measurement and, and management. Wonderful. Thank you guys for contrib contributing together to, um, yeah, no doubt that question. It's a great question and um, it'll be good to see some research um, happening in there. Now I am very, um, uh, look at, I'm looking at the time and we're going to wrap up the questions now but thank you so much for uh, coming together today um, all of our speakers. Um, Carla, Louise, Wes, Jenny and Dan um, for sharing your experience, uh, experiences, expertise and volunteering your time to be involved in this workshop so thank you very much. A huge thanks to Mick and the team at Peel Harvey Catchment Council who have supported this event through funding from the Australian Government's National Land Care Program and our other supporters of the event, Meat and Livestock Australia, Podega Investments and the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. As mentioned earlier, this recording will be available to view as a video and as a podcast. Uh, details of how to access these recordings will be emailed to you as soon as they are available. If you want to sign up to the Future Food Network, please head to www.futurefoodnetwork.com.au. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we hope to see you all again at our next workshop and uh, we'll see you all later.